Okay. So thank you very much, Jean, for that introduction. Tanisabo and I are both very happy to be here. Um, as Jean was saying, we were hoping that it would be Bojangas in Bellingham, but now it's just Bojangas on Zoom, which is less exciting and less uh, consonant. Um, but yeah, this is a, a great place. It doesn't really matter where we are. Uh, we can practice the, the Bojangas, these enlightenment factors, where, wherever we are. So people hopefully have access to the, the day's schedule. And like the awakening factors, which are really a practice about balance, uh, not having too much of any one uh, extreme factor in our, in our meditations, in our life, in our, in our practice, uh, but really keeping, uh, keeping a broader awareness of things and really recognizing when uh, the different helpful factors are in balance versus when they're out of balance. Uh, we'll be balancing the day's schedule with uh, quite a number of periods of just sitting, formal sitting and walking meditation with, with no guidance. When we'll just, uh, Tanisabo and I will uh, mute our audio and everyone else will uh, be muted as well. And during those periods, Tanisabo and I uh, may come on with, uh, with our bell and ring the bell just on the half hours to mark the periods in case people want to get up and change posture. Uh, and these will be alternated with periods of uh, Tanisabo and I giving reflections and periods of question and answer. So these are just you know, ways of whether we're listening or talking or uh, going out or staying in or thinking versus remaining silent, figuring out ways to, to balance all of these, these qualities. So the factors of awakening, the bojangas, which are the theme of today's discourse are a very rich teaching. Uh, at one point, the Buddha gives the following teaching. He says, ye sata bojanga tata Sabeheva, Samagehi, Samodamanehi, Avivadamanehi, Sikitabanti. So, what that means is regarding these seven factors of awakening, you should practice in harmony. You should practice uh, in a friendly way. You should practice together. He's talking to all the bhikkhus and uh, lay people who were present at the time. Uh, you should practice in this way and train in this way. So I think this is a, a beautiful uh, introduction to the teachings is that uh, we wanna practice in harmony um, and we're practicing towards peace and we're practicing in a way, in a, in a group format. Although we're all spread out around the globe, uh, we've come here on this screen, all these little rectangles together forming one big rectangle and uh, practicing in a way which is in, in harmony. Uh, the Pali word is samagi, samagi. And this is a, a quality which is really highlighted in many teachings in Thailand, especially in monasteries where you want all the people living in the monastery to get together. You really highlight this aspect of harmony. But it's a, a good quality to think about both in terms of interpersonal dynamics. So how am I thinking about the other rectangles on the screen, the other people in this call, the other people in my life? Uh, am I practicing these seven factors of awakening in a harmonious way? Or am I uh, fault finding and uh, practicing in a way which is a bit out of kilter, a way which is uh, too rigid or too loose? Um, so we want to practice with, with metta in this way. The seven factors of awakening uh, are as follows. They are sati or mindfulness, dhamma vichya or investigation of qualities. You've got virya or energy slash effort. You've got piti, which is rapture or delight or joy. You've got pasadi, which is tranquility or calming, 
calm, relaxation. You've got samadhi, which is concentration or collectedness of mind. And you've got upeka, which is uh, equanimity or equipoise. And these are the seven. And in different discourses, the Buddha presented them uh, in roughly three different ways, either as uh, a checklist, so something which we can look at at any moment of our meditation or our daily life and say, okay, do we have each of these? Do I, do I right now, uh, is there an aspect of mindfulness present? Is mindfulness present? Is investigation of mental qualities present? Is uh, our rapture and energy and tranquility and samadhi and uh, upeka or equanimity are all of these present right now? So you can look at this as a checklist. Uh, you can also look at the factors of awakening as a progression. So in one sutta or more, the Buddha says, for one who practices mindfulness, then there comes about uh, investigation of dhammas. For one who practices investigation of dhammas, there comes about energy. For one who practices and cultivates investigation, there comes about uh, energy. And then energy leads to this joy or this rapture, which then leads to uh, calm or the relaxation, which leads to collectedness or concentration, which then leads to equanimity. So that's the progression or the stepwise approach. Uh, and then you also have teachings which the Buddha posits this or puts this as a balance. So if the mind is agitated, then you want to recollect the calming factors. So if the mind is thinking too much and you just want to chill out, you bring to mind the latter three qualities of calm and collectedness and equanimity. Whereas if the mind is torporific and tired and sluggish and you're just nodding and fading, then you want to give attention to the three, uh, three of the former qualities of investigation of dhammas and energy and this joy. These are uplifting qualities which will bring you out of that, uh, that slothful, that slothfulness to whatever degree you have it. And then in that model, sati or mindfulness is the balance. Sati is, is always necessary. It's always a good thing to be, uh, to be recollecting, to be uh, focusing our mind around. So that is, we've got a checklist approach, we've got a stepwise approach, and we've got a uh, balance approach just before um, we started talking, Tanisabo gave two really, or a, a really nice uh, images for all of these. So we've got the Bojangas or the enlightenment factors as a web. This is like Indra's net or just, um, you know, like this diamond web where each factor is uh, a checklist or a mirror or a reflection of the other ones. Do I have this, this web, this wholesome net of good qualities in my mind in this moment. Or the stepwise approach is like a ladder. So from mindfulness, then I lead up to Dhammavichya and then lead up to uh, energy and et cetera. So you're just stepping up this ladder and really the ladder is a circular ladder. It's like a, a, stair, uh, uh, a circular stepwise staircase. So equanimity can then lead back into mindfulness in Dhammavichya. So you, you keep going up and you keep going up, or you can consider it, you know, spiraling down deeper and deeper, more and more profound. You're getting to more and more basic, more and more uh, fundamental and grounded and grounding states as you kind of descend this staircase or getting more and more uh, enlightened and um, yeah, spacious and uplifting um, states, if you conceive of the staircase going upwards. So we've got a web and we've got a staircase and we've got a seesaw. That's the, the balance approach with sati as the, the fulcrum. And uh, we're just balancing, you know, we don't want our, our practice, our lives to, 
be flip-flopping back and forth, but really achieve balance. Like you, the seesaw fully um, level. You know, if you were to put a level on this seesaw, it would be uh, fully balanced. So these are three different conceptions of the, the Bojangas. And Tanisabo and I will be going into each of the factors one by one and kind of uh, enlarging them and giving a, a bigger perspective on each one of them and how they relate to the others. And we'll be focusing on it both in terms of meditation, because uh, as that Anapanasati Sutta, that chant that we just did, um, these seven enlightenment factors really do uh, conduce towards concentration. They conduce towards uh, collectedness of mind. So when we practice the seven factors of awakening during our daily life, then that helps our meditation and it helps our collectedness, our concentration, our samadhi. And similarly, when we practice more formally, the more collected and consummate and uh, coalesced our, um, our mindfulness is and our uh, meditations are during formal periods of practice, then the more centered and uh, balanced we can be during our, our daily life practice. So ultimately we wanna to get to a place where these distinctions um, are, are blurred. It really becomes much less meaningful. This daily life versus formal practice distinction is much less rigid. It's much less black and white and more just a, a beautiful spectrum of, uh, well, you can think of it as, as all the colors are just, um, yeah, you've got the full spectrum of life held within the Dhamma. So, yeah, I think with that brief introduction and uh, urging to just practice in, in harmony and practice in a, a balanced and holistic way, we can just sit for about half an hour or so and all ring our bell um, at the end. So in about half an hour, and then Tanisabha will give a bit more specific guidance on the, the first several factors. Okay, so Tanisbo has written out the factors in the chat just as a cheat sheet. But really the focus of today, we do so much thinking in our daily lives that we really want to allow our practice today to be much less uh, cerebral and really just bringing our practice inwards. So whether you're sitting on a chair or sitting on the ground. The first two things that we need to collect and coalesce are the body and the mind. So bringing the body to a upright position, an energetic posture, the spine upright. And this is something, this is a, a dynamic process. Our posture is a dynamic alignment, which will sway. The body is pulled by gravity 
and by the musculature will pull this way and that, but we relate to this dynamic posture and bring it to, to balance or equipoise. The head is balanced on the top of the spine. And with the spine upright, all the rest of the musculature of the body, all of our muscles can just totally relax. So we've got the energetic uplift of the spine and the totally relaxant and soft and wet blanket aspect of the musculature, just totally allowing our body to still with this dynamic. And with the body roughly in place, then bringing the mind to the breath. People are of course welcome to use whatever object you're most familiar with, but for our day long today, as we focus on the Factors of Enlightenment, Tom Nissable and I will mostly be speaking about the breath. So we can use the breath as a coalescent, as a, an object which the mind can consolidate and configure around. And just as the Sutta says, Mindful we breathe in and mindful we breathe out. We try to know every in-breath and every out-breath. You can really focus on any part of the body where you see the breath clearly. It can be the tip of the nose, upper lip, the lungs or the chest or the belly, or even the whole body. Think of whole body breathing. From this perspective, the point or the particular spot that we're focusing on isn't so important, but just the continual knowing wherever we're knowing of the full beginning, middle, and end of every in-breath and the full beginning, middle, and end of every out-breath.
and the mind starts to constrict. And the mind seems to be going towards aversion, aversiveness. Or if the body is tensing up in a painful way. Just breathing in metta. All of us are here. All of us are paying attention to this breath. Because we want the best for ourselves and we want the best for others. And so just softening, allowing that overarching perspective that this metta, this is the, this is the space, this is the warmth. This is the room in which all of our practice, all of our meditation, each and every breath is, is living in. And if the mind is wandering, thinking about this and that, really thinking about anything other than just being with the breath, this beautiful in-breath, beautiful out-breath. Maybe you can pay a bit more attention to the out-breaths. So if the mind is agitated or doesn't want to settle, the out-breath, this exhale, this is the aspect of calming. So to balance the mind that loves, is obsessed with, thought and thinking and cogitation and just chewing on this and that and doesn't ever want to settle this exhale 
tranquility, collectedness, equanimity. Exhale. You only have so many of these breaths left in our life and each one can be as appreciated as we, we make it. You are finding the mind sluggish. If you can wake up and realize that your body's been slumping, your head has been nodding more and more. The whole body just collapsing on itself, or even if it's just the mind, not with the object, just in some kind of vague, dull, nondescript, who knows where, some kind of abyss that you just disappeared into, and the mind has forgotten the breath in this way. And come back and maybe for a few breaths, give a little bit more attention to the in-breath. So this is investigation, and energy, and joy. With every in-breath, 
bringing fresh air into your system and invigorating this desire to stay right here in the present moment and to practice and become more and more familiar with this place, this, this sacred space, which so much of us, unfortunately, seem to be vacant from. Knowing every in-breath and every out-breath.
every in-breath, knowing every out-breath. Just recognizing that the more we can stay with the whole in-breath, the full length, the full breath of every out-breath, the more we can really stay with this in a bright and clear way, and the more subtle and the more clear the mind can become. When we're practicing presence. It's good not to hold the practice in a fearful way, like I can only stay right here on this very tiny fulcrum, this tiny present moment, always ready to tip over into thoughts of the past or thoughts of future or anxiety or flip back into dullness or switch from anger to greed. It's just on this tiny point that we have to balance. We can Think instead of a broader present moment, a present, not just this present point. Broad present.
So um, people can shift position a bit um, if they want. And now uh, those who want can also continue to meditate and keep their eyes closed uh, or open them as you will. And um, uh, usually in our tradition, a Dhamma talk is uh, one can listen to it um, with as they meditate. So we'll go for about a half an hour. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Udang damang sangang namasami. So it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. And uh, Ajahn Kovilo did a great job of introducing this topic of the seven factors of awakening. And um, recently, I've I heard a quote a few about a month ago that if you want to uh, get people to go to sea, you don't um, necessarily teach them to mill the wood and hoist the rigging but you teach them to love the ocean. But I find in the West uh, and with sort of modern American spirituality, we find ourselves in the opposite situation. We have a wealth of poems and poets um, and sort of vague, uh, vague spirituality. Um, and I, uh, I love eat, pray, love as much as the next person. Um, but uh, what we don't have is a practical means towards how you actually cultivate a clear mind and an awakened heart, how you mill the wood, how you hoist the rigging, how you get the ship out to sea. And this is the Buddha's great gift to us is a system of psychology and mental training that is uh, profound in a way that I think is difficult for those who haven't immersed themselves in the teachings to really uh, believe. But the level of profundity of uh, teachings like dependent origination um, and how we train the mind uh, that the Buddha left us with in his 45 years of teaching after his enlightenment um, is, is astounding. So the seven factors of awakening are one of the more practical lists he gives us. You'll notice that you know the uh, metaphors that Ajahn Koilo brought up around a net, a uh, seesaw, a ladder, they're practical, um, uh, tangible objects. Um, and this is the nature of analogy and metaphor, but it's also worth noting that uh, some of the lists the Buddha gives deal with deeper level uh, defilements um, or uh, qualities and higher level patterning. But uh, two lists he gives are very practical means of evaluating every moment uh, in a very um, detailed and approachable way. One can see these two lists on display at the end of the Satipatthana, the Foundations of Mindfulness Discourse, where the fourth foundation, mindfulness of Dhamma, Dhamma categories, which is a difficult translation um, for those who are just you know, approaching the teaching, the four foundations of mindfulness are basically frameworks of experience uh, that we look at our experience through body, in the body, um, feelings as feelings, uh, mind as mind, and then dhammas as dhammas or dhamma categories. And that fourth foundation is essentially overlaying the Buddhist teaching teachings onto our experience, mapping our experience onto those teachings. And that fourth foundation is uh, quite broad, but 
in the poly canon, but comparative studies have really pretty um, reliably narrowed it down to the Buddha talking about the five hindrances versus the seven factors of awakening. Those are the two lists the Buddha gives for evaluating your experience moment to moment to moment. So the five hindrances, uh, you know, aren't necessarily dealing with these deeper level defilements of greed, hatred, and delusion. Um, they are, they're outgrowths of them, but they're practical means of seeing their manifestation in every meditative or non-meditative moment. Is there sensual lust? Is there aversion? Is there sloth and torpor? Is there restlessness? Is there doubt? The counterpoint to that practical list of negative qualities is the bojangas, the seven factors. So these are the practical handles the Buddha gives us for evaluating moment to moment to moment our own experience. Um, how mindful are we being? Uh, how much are we investigating our experience with Dhamma Vichaya? Uh, what energy is present? What quality of rapture? Uh, what bodily and mental tranquility? What concentration? What equipoise? So it's useful to know that these are our direct routes to looking clearly at our own minds. And not only that, but they're things to be developed as counterbalances, antidotes to the five hindrances. And this is where um, it's so helpful to think of them as a ladder, as stepping stones. Because some of the other lists the Buddha gives, such as the indriyas, the faculties, um, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom, they move more or less from qualities of sort of centeredness, concentration, uh, faith, to wisdom. And this is difficult for moderns to utilize because so many of us have been uh, educated and conditioned to think a lot and not necessarily to have great faith right away. So to start there and arrive at wisdom is a tall order. Whereas the seven factors of awakening actually start with wisdom and appropriate attention, thinking, and they move towards concentration. This is a practical approach for moderns. This uh, route through our thinking, with our thinking, utilizing our active minds towards centeredness, calm, unification. This is the ladder of the Bojangas, and it's one we can actually climb. However, there is, before we, uh, the latter is most practically embodied in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, which is the Buddha's most um, detailed, perhaps, uh, meditation manual in one sutta. It's brilliant, 16 steps. And uh, he explicitly says, and this is why we chanted it at the beginning, that developing mindfulness of breathing develops and results in the fulfillment of the seven factors of awakening, which eventually issues into true, true knowledge and deliverance. But before we move on to that practical application, um, it's worth revisiting the, mind, the uh, factors of awakening just briefly as that seesaw analogy, um, a balancing of the three factors of energy and the three factors of calm, all centered around the fulcrum of mindfulness. And this is because um, the it's not just a single boarded seesaw. Um, I don't know the technical terminology with seesaws. There's three involved. And each factor is paired with another. So this is going to, this is a bit complicated, but it's interesting. Um, the two longest, it, there's a long, a medium, and a short board all around this fulcrum of mindfulness. So the long board 
Um, on the energetic side, you have Dhammavichai investigation of qualities. And on the calming side, you have equanimity, equipoise. And that's the longest board um, because it uh, those two qualities deal with both the internal and the external world. You develop equanimity towards your external environment and towards your internal world as well. And similarly, um, with investigation of dhammas, you learn to investigate and see clearly your external world and your internal. The middle to the middle length board, uh, the two qualities that balance each other there are uh, wiria energy, which has to do with the body and the mind. It's all internal, but it deals with mental and physical uh, qualities, paired with pasadi, tranquility, which is also mental and physical. And then the shortest board, the most refined pairing, is between piti, uh, rapture, which is just mental, um, but it can be present with uh, directed thought and evaluation, with thinking or without, paired against um, samadhi, which similarly can be uh, concentration, which can be present with thinking and without. So I wouldn't get too drawn into those, but it's useful to note the different domains of each of these factors. And taken together, they not only influence and reflect one another, like Indra's net, as Ajahn Kovila was saying, but uh, they can that net can hold our whole world. And often, before we sit down on the cushion, it's necessary to really utilize those that widest board, um, because if we are tied to and obsessed with the external world, we won't be able to pull inwards. So there's a real place for, before you sit down or in your meditation, if external phenomena and thoughts keep coming in, can you use investigation of dhammas and equanimity to put that down for a second and this is really um, useful coming into even a day-long retreat. My uh, parents often compare coming to a monastery to stopping a car and watching all your luggage hit you in the back of the head. So is there any way that we can, you know, acknowledge that that's the case coming into retreat, it's fine. Um, let those things be there, but learn how to look at them, to investigate them in a skillful way such that you are able to put them down. And uh, often that can just mean, um, you know, one method is applying the Four Noble Truths to them and seeing the suffering. Um, so if the uh, argument from the past, you know, few weeks or days comes up, really just feeling the burn of it. And often so much of our mental activity is just us running from a suffering that we aren't yet acknowledging. We haven't utilized and used the first noble truth of comprehending, turning towards our pain. And so we have no choice but to run from it. So often a whole retreat can basically just be spiritual bypass unless you take that first moment and sit down and before diving into the technique, into spreading, you know, shooting meta rays out at people, just take a second. How is your heart? Is there bruising? what's left from the week. And those echoes, the shadows of the argument, of the disappointment, of whatever's there, of the worry, can you not shove it out the window right away? But can you really take the Buddha seriously in his admonition in the first noble truth to comprehend suffering? Lay your hands on your own pain. Feel its shape a little. You don't have to indulge in it. You don't have to follow it. But just let your heart rest for a second. That's the first step. And then, then you can move on to the subsequent three noble truths of letting go of craving, of finding peace, of developing the path and these techniques. And honestly, if all this retreat is, is feeling those echoes a little bit and tasting, sort of uh, understanding the bruising of the heart, over the past bit, that's not a bad use of a day. 
So that's one method of appropriate attention um, of investigation of dhammas. Um, and the others uh, might include things like uh, just reflecting that, uh, you know, say you're worried about something in the future, just understanding that if you manage, this is your chance to put that down. And if you can do that for just a day, then when you reapproach it afterwards, um, you'll actually have resources and a centered mind to approach it with. And if this has to do with doubt, you can't decide on something, understand that there's no path through doubt, uh, with doubt through doubt. Um, you can't get beyond doubt through doubt, I think as Ajahn Kobilo has said. And um, that these, uh, you have to let that mind state dissolve and then things, problems don't usually solve themselves, they dissolve. But once the external, external world has been put aside a bit, we can embark on this project of cultivation of meditation. And uh, in this context, it is useful to look at the uh, enlightenment factors as a ladder and to map them on to the mindfulness of breathing sutta, at least to some extent. So the first uh, of all the factors um, begins with uh, mindfulness, which is, um, and this is present throughout, uh, one form of cognition is called metacognition, M-E-T-A. And it basically is mindfulness. It means knowing what sort of attention to apply. And this is how we uh, know where we are in our meditation, what step we're at, what we need to be applying at that moment. Um, so that is to say that's present throughout. And we begin the meditation by establishing that and embodying it in our posture, come to an upright place, raise the spine and notice if that's falling. That's the first step of the Anapanasati Sutta, or it's the prelude to the steps. The next step is, uh, uh, or the next of the enlightenment factors is uh, this Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of Dhammas. And in a meditative context of the uh, Anapanasati Sutta, um, one can think of this as basically playing. Um, if meditation is simply an act of willpower, bringing the mind back to one place or one object, it's very limited and limiting. But if we have this wide tool belt um, of uh, active thinking, basically using thought to calm thought, to hamstring thought, then we have a way to calm. And it's fun, it's interesting, it's playful. So I find a useful paradigm uh, to approach meditation with that really allows this playfulness. Um, you know, in the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, the Buddha gives us uh, a set of tools and steps that are quite good. Um, so the beginning is just to uh, center at the breath. And that's your anchor throughout the meditation. Always in every step of the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, there's this refrain, breathing in, breathing out. So always you have that at the center of experience or there in the periphery, at least. That's always present. Um, that's your anchor. And I think of this often as sitting in the center of a room with a bird in your hands and feeling the bird. Uh, the Buddha often compared meditation object to a bird, uh, saying if you held it too, too tightly, it crushed it. And if you held it too loosely, it flew away. But then every step of that sutta um, deals with a uh, wider or more active object or another intention, basically, alongside that centering, anchoring object of the breath. And those objects can include uh, things like in the sutta explicitly becoming aware of the whole body, cultivating rapture, uh, becoming sensitive to different qualities of the mind, uh, cultivating ease, things like this, gladdening the mind. And uh, the Buddha often gives the analogies in, uh, for concentration around a bath man uh, using his hands to knead in this moisture into a ball of dry bath powder until it's pervaded. 
all to say that at the beginning of the sutta, there's real permission and license to use thought to cultivate the sense of well being, of interest, to use active perceptions. And so I think of this as um, first of all, you know, you have your centered object, you sitting, sitting at the center of the room with that bird of the breath, wherever you feel it most prominently. But then the active object that you get to cultivate um, can be either a, a wide field of the body. So if you know an Ajahn Lee breath technique, as such as taught by Ajahn Suchit or Ajahn Jeff, uh, you can go through that. So one is to imagine the body is three chambers, the upper, the middle, and the lower. And just to imagine breathing in white mist, a white moisturizing, um, enlivening mist uh, into each in turn. And after you've moved through each of those, pervading it with this white mist of the breath, expand awareness to hold the entire field of the body, um, but center at that one point of the breath, at the tip of the nose, at the diaphragm, at the belly, wherever you feel it. And in this way, you have cultivated actively um, a wide active perception. You've used Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of Dhammas, to play, to apply a perception and see how it feels, how it tastes. Does it work? Is it interesting? Because it should be interesting and playful. That's the proper dynamic of meditation. Um, and you have maintained your center. So it's as if you're at the center of that room with the bird of the breath, but you've walked around, you've opened the windows, you've let in the light, a breeze, and then you can sit back down with the breath um, and just allow both to be in your awareness at the same time, that broad, bright field of the body and the breath. And this plays into the uh, second awakening factor of effort, wiria. Because applying these perceptions, not only does it involve Dhamma Vichaya, um, investigation of Dhammas, applying a perception, seeing how it tastes, how it feels, being playful, but each of those takes a certain amount of effort, but it's not a dry, you know, furrowed eyebrow effort. It's a playful, enjoyable effort. It's joyous. So one issue is that some people don't necessarily have immediate access to that wide field of the body. Um, so a, another secondary object alongside the breath that people can access is loving kindness. You can apply Dhamma Vichaya and effort in cultivating that broad field. And that's, um, you know, bring to mind, uh, most of you know how to do metta practice, but bring to mind someone you love, someone you care for. Um, if you're having difficulty bringing that to mind, think of someone on their deathbed or as a child and hold their hand. Uh, shrink people you care about and bring them into that warm field of metta in your heart. These are active perceptions uh, using, using this investigation of dhammas and energy to try a perception, see how it feels. Does it bring up that glow of metta? And if it does, if there's a phrase you can use, then lean on that. And the um, other two objects I find that work is really good broad objects to hold in tandem with the centered object um, include the perception of light, uh, which sometimes manifests later in the meditation. People miss it because they're often looking for a single ball of light or a sort of image, but often it's a brightening of the whole visual field. And if that starts to come up, foreground that and keep the breath in the background and give yourself to it and watch it brighten. And the other is if someone's cultivated the sound of silence, which is, I've heard compared to the auditory equivalent of the perception of light, then that might rise up this sort of huddle, subtle hissing or ringing below the auditory landscape. And that can be your secondary or broad active object. So that can all sound fairly complicated, but basically it's just a practical means um, of there's always a slight effort in meditation. And this is wiria 
even when these sort of active perceptions have faded, when the mind has become calm and you no longer feel like bringing up the image of someone from Metta because the warm glow in the heart has grown so that it's self-sustaining, or when you no longer need to move through the chambers of the body um, with an active visualization because you have this broad, bright sense of awareness and that's just there alongside the breath. Um, you're still applying effort on a subtle level because you're working to become and stay sensitive to these things. And often it can be very simple. Um, you know, in directed thought and evaluation in meditation is often compared to ringing a bell and listening to its resonance. So as the mind becomes calm, you need to ring it less. So maybe after things have become calm and the metta is just glowing on its own because you don't, the visualization is not meaningful. It's the glow, the warm feeling. And when that's been cultivated, maybe you just need to drop in a single word every 60 seconds, metta, love, friendship, listening, or breath, light, spacious. And then just listen and taste that ring. That's the application of effort, wiria, after you've dropped the more coarse rung of the ladder of Dhammavichaya, investigation of Dhammas, once you've moved your hand to the next rung. And that effort eventually really leads to this third energizing factor, the most subtle of pity, rapture. And this is, you know, that glow of, of metta. Um, this is that sense of the bodily breath energy nourishing, nourishing you. Um, it's that, you know, uh, enlivening sense. And there comes a point where you just taste that more and more and direct yourself. It's sort of, you're listening to that resonance of the bell. And there may come a point where you really have to ring that bell almost not at all and can really just listen and rest in it. And that's enough. And the one final thing I'd end with is acknowledging that often um, we have to return to Dhammavichaya, investigation of Dhammas. It's such a powerful tool because often there will be one hindrance that continually comes up. And I, this has happened for me a lot is I'll sort of say, often be stuck in doubt about a future plan or even the meditation technique. And doubt is an especially debilitating hindrance because we can buy into it as a legitimate part of our meditation. Like, oh, I'm really unsure about this technique. Is this correct? And you just can proliferate the whole 30 minutes about it. So there's a real place for if something continues to draw you away, you know, if it's just a slight rising of a thought, an echo of a conversation, acknowledge it and come back to your object. But if something keeps coming up, then the investigation of dhammas there is just focus on it, um, name it, doubt, 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 and make that the object of your meditation. And you're turning towards it you're acknowledging it. And if, you know, one of the pieces of sitting and meditation is that uh, you're seeing your patterns that dominate your life in a controlled environment on a small scale. So you'll notice that exactly how you control your breath is how you try, try to control your spouse. How you berate yourself when you wander is exactly how you berate your child. Um, and if you can understand these patterns in the meditation and soften them, that effect will pervade out through your whole life. So all to say that if your meditation is really just you seeing your doubt, acknowledging it, feeling it's how much it hurts, um, seeing the same about anger and you can't come to the breath at all. You know, I mean, maybe it's in the background and it should be, 
But if it's just naming that for the meditation for the day, that's a good use of a day um, because you're seeing what keeps you from peace and selflessness and love. So that's uh, plenty for now. I think uh, we'll have a chance now for uh, an hour of sitting. And by an hour, I mean, well, I mean an hour actually. So uh, we, uh, people should feel free to take a bio break. Um, and I know we said we'd ring the bell at the half an hour, but do we want to do that or just give people the license to sit and walk as they will? What would you like, Ajahn? Um, yeah, how about people can just, you can ring your own bell and uh, keep track of the half hours for yourself if you're so inclined. Okay, cool. Um, and we'll come back together at uh, maybe 11.25 or 11.30, 25 or so, and just all kind of say goodbye for lunch, something of that nature. Great, great. Chant a meal blessing. And Chant. we'll ring the bell at, mm. at uh, 11.25. Yeah, great. Thank you, Arjun. Recording in progress. So we've now got a hour break and you can call it a break, but uh, really there's no real need to stop cultivating what we're cultivating. Um, I've put a link in the chat to the reflection on the four requisites and Tan Nisibo and I will here in a moment chant the recollection of alms food and uh, the word pendapata is used in the chant which means alms for monks but the Buddha also uses the same reflection just for food for anyone so um, Tan Nisibo and I will chant that and as we eat it's good to see if we can uh, eat in a way which really embodies, which takes this this net, this jeweled web of of wholesome qualities, these seven bojangas, into our eating process, and eating in a way which maximizes uh, all of these seven qualities, both while we're eating, so bringing a reflection on how we're eating, uh, the noises we're making or not making, uh, the gracefulness of uh, how we how we eat and bringing um, energy and eating in a way which leads to more energy, uh, bringing joy and gratitude to the process, eating in a way which is tranquil and leads to tranquility, which is collected and leads to more collectedness and in an equanimous way. So we'll screen share and people can stay muted just because Zoom isn't great for chanting at the same time, and people can certainly chant along as Tan Nisibo and I lead. And we'll just do the, the English version. Wisely reflecting, I use alms food, not for fun, not for pleasure, not for fattening, not for beautification, only for the maintenance and nourishment of this body, for keeping it healthy, for helping with the holy life, thinking thus, I will allay hunger without overeating, so that I may continue to live blamelessly and at ease. Okay. Well, I hope everyone has a good break for the meal, and we'll meet back at 12.30. I think start right into another sitting and walking period. Actually, we might go right into a Q&A. I can't totally remember. Um, Jean, or is I going to have it here? Sitting and walking, yeah. Okay. Half an hour of that, and then we'll go into a Dhamma talk. Okay. Great. Okay. See you all soon.
Recording in progress. to the afternoon of our day long. And hopefully everyone's minds are beginning to, to settle. Just as the Buddha suggests would happen when you think of the bojangas, these enlightenment factors as sequential steps. Uh, sometimes I like the image of the snow globe or a snow globe. Um, basically, as you sit in meditation, whether it's uh, just an hour or however long the mind can settle, or if it's a, a full day, you have even more time to just let the mind settle. It's like a snow globe that you put on your desk. And if you don't knock the desk or don't kind of jostle the, the globe at all, then the, all the tinsel and the, the glitter in the snow globe can just fall fall to the ground and it's clear it's just clear and you can see right through it so hopefully that's where everyone is at it's possible though that after a meal uh, some people's minds might be a little bit groggy your bodies might be a little bit heavy it's at these times that uh, people teaching retreats kind of wish that the exciting enlightenment factors were taught in the afternoon rather than the, the calming ones. But here we are, and we'll cover the three remaining enlightenment factors of pasadi, which is tranquility or calm or relaxing, samadhi, which is concentration or the translations I like collectedness or even firm foundation of mind, and upeka, or equanimity, equipoise, this balance. So even as you listen, one nice thing about this Zoom medium is that you do have a measure of choice that you wouldn't in a in-person meeting when you're doing group meditation together, in that you can turn your volume up and down. So if the mind is sluggish and you're a bit tired, you might experiment with turning the volume up or even turning the pitch up. If you're excited and restless, you might want to turn the volume down a bit, maybe even turn up the, the bass. Um, so these are just, these are almost metaphors for what we're doing with the mind when we're trying to uh, collect it when we're trying to practice uh, in a in a more formal context. So uh, there is a collection of the Buddhist teachings called the Sangyutta Nikaya, or the Collected Discourses of the Buddha is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, or the Linked Discourses, I believe, is Bhante Sujato's translation, and. In this, this, this set of discourses, um, there's a whole chapter or a whole section on the Bojangas, on the enlightenment factors. And there you'll find over 130 different discourses, short and medium, and even a couple long ones, all centered around this theme of the Bojangas. And there's some really beautiful suttas in there. If you ever want some Dhammavichya, if you ever want some of this investigative quality. And um, one of the beautiful discourses in there is about fire and about uh, fuel and fueling a fire or dampening a fire down. So when you've got a fire which is about to go out and you want a nice, glowing, steady fire, but the fire is about to go out, you add kindling to it, you add dry 
grass to it, et cetera, to build it up and to keep it going steady and firm and keep it ablaze and sharp. Uh, similarly, if the mind is sluggish and torporific, uh, the mind is feeling full, the body is feeling weighed down, you want to add uh, exciting mental qualities to it. So this is thinking of uh, the investigation of dhammas, the effort and joy, bringing up joy. But if the fire is raging, which really I think for most of us, for most Americans, perhaps most of the time, our fires are just raging. Our minds are out of control. Just, And it, it might not feel like that just because we've gotten used to the heat. We become uh, acclimated to such uh, a high temperature. The We don't even realize the global inner warming that's going on uh, based on all of the fuel that we've been adding to it, basically all the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, and thoughts, which we're just addicted to, and which we're just throwing more and more fuel and garbage, really, onto this, this fire. And, um, on a, you know, it's not remarkable. It's totally to be expected that when you add all this fuel, um, especially, especially um, yeah, unclean fuel, then you're going to get a, a smoldering you're going to get a big, you're going to get a big fire and uh, with a lot of smoke. So at these times, the Buddha says, this is the time when you sprinkle the fire with, with water. This is the time when you maybe put wet grass onto the fire. And similarly, if the mind is thinking too much, if the mind doesn't want to settle, if you want to think about something else other than the breath, which is our, our general focus, if you're focusing in another way on the sound of silence, but the sounds of your thoughts just keep coming in, this is the time for cultivating these latter three, uh, latter three awakening factors. So the Buddha said that uh, each of these factors, not just the latter three, but all seven, uh, have fuel, um, just like. Uh, just like a fire has fuel. Similarly, these enlightenment factors have fuel, which makes them increase and other types of fuel or other mental activities, which actually makes them decrease. So what does the Buddha say are, is the fuel for pasadi or this tranquility, this calmness, this relaxation, which really we want to be bringing to uh, every breath, when the mind is wanting to settle, especially on the occasion of having a, a whole day to relax and to practice like this and, and go deeper. Uh, the fuel, the what's actually called the ahara, the nutriment, actually the food, the food for this enlightenment factor, the food for relaxation and calm is bodily calm and mental calm. So the fuel for tranquility, is bodily tranquility and mental tranquility. So uh, this is helpful. If the mind is just totally out of control, one thing you can do is just relax the body. Uh, if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, my mind goes to this movie Requiem for a Dream made about 20 years ago, in which there's a the mother figure, and this is uh, is kind of hooked on speed. And there's this just scene of watching her clean her house. And the scene is in slow motion, but watching her in fast motion. And uh, yeah, oftentimes that's what we're doing. We don't even realize that we just got this uh, program on autopilot and we're just cleaning or surfing the net. Click, click, click. And really just uh, going on without much reflection, just based on uh, all the fuel of um, excitement and lust and thirst for, for thoughts, our addiction to the whole thinking process. So at those times, if you're literally running around, try just sitting down, try turning off your computer. And if that's not working, if you're still feeling totally wigged out, totally spazzed out, then 
there's no shame in lying down meditation. And if your mind is really agitated, then that might be the best thing you can do. So actually lying down and even better is if you've got one of these weighted blankets. I used to have a huge robe that I made for when we were sitting outside at a Baigiri in the cold. It was nine layers of cloth packed on top of each other. And it was just so heavy and I loved it. So you can buy these things. I, I don't have one, but you could probably look on Amazon, a weighted blanket, basically just something which helps you not move. And this is Kaya Pasadi. This is the tranquility of the body. And when you actually let the body relax, the mind might go in tow. So experiment with that. If you're fiddling, um, perhaps whatever those fidget spinners, whatever they're called, maybe that's not the best thing. Maybe you will uh, work your energy out that way, but it might just be uh, keeping you spinning. Um, so experiment with this, uh, just letting the body calm and uh, letting the body relax. And then with that, Another fuel for this pasadi uh, is mental relaxation. So this especially is amenable to um, in your daily life, turning off all of your, your streaming devices when you, when you can and how you can. Uh, but here in meditation, um, yeah, allowing the volume to settle, letting all the, letting the snow globe just calm. Uh, the word pasadi uh, comes from the root samb, shramb in Sanskrit, which means to, to pacify or just to grow soft, to grow calm. And pa is a modifying prefix, which just indicates and then some, plus plus. So calm plus plus, tranquility and then some. So it's basically uh, yeah, letting the body and the mind just relax. So the next quality is samadhi. And you have a number of sequences in the Buddha's discourses where he talks about the progression from uh, bodily and mental tranquility to concentration and the intermediate step, which just almost can come naturally if you just let the body and the mind relax and you're keeping awake and alert and upright and bright, um, yeah, fully alert, but also calm. The intermediate step, which is not one of the Bojangas explicitly, uh, but does come in between tranquility and concentration is sukha. So is happiness or, or pleasure. So pasadi or tranquility plus pleasure leads to samadhi, leads to collectedness. And in that same sutta about the fuels for samadhi, the Buddha says that there are two fuels for the arising of unarisen samadhi and the increase and the deepening and the profound makingness of, of samadhi. Uh, and what are those that are paying wise attention, yoniso manasikara, paying wise attention to the avyaga nimitta and the samatha nimitta. So nimitta just means, it literally means a sign or uh, here we can also almost think of it as the perception or the characteristic, the characteristic of samatha or of tranquility and the characteristic, the nimitta, the sign of avyaga or non-complicatedness. Vaga means a tumult or just a gathering of people. So when a bunch of people are around, especially when you're not at a Buddhist monastery and you're in the middle of New York, Times Square, at New Year's, this tumult, um, this raucous going on, uh, of yoga nimitta, paying attention to the opposite of that, the very much the uh, polar opposite of that is a, a place of, of stillness in the woods by yourself, 
perception of, of forest. And yeah, giving wise attention to that. So paying attention to these things. And what's fascinating about uh, these different foods or these different fuels for the enlightenment factors is that the Buddha says that they're always there. These are characteristics, these are aspects of our living experience, which are all always there. We can turn to and give wise attention to uh, the characteristic of non-tumult of yoga nimitta, the characteristic of, of calming. So if you're just proliferating, the mind is just wanting to think on top of think, uh, odd, ad, infinitum, ad, nauseum, uh, you can just give attention to this already present state, which is just, it's just nascent. It's, it's just waiting for you to give attention to. So doing that and respecting, respecting these, this potential for letting the mind collect. And we can do this with, with every, every breath. So as we were mentioning during the guided meditation, generally speaking, the in-breaths are inspiration, bringing the spirit in, this upwelling, this postural correct, this uprightness, and uh, broadly speaking, or even metaphorically speaking, the out-breath is more calming, this ah, oh, just letting go. And that's more uh, parallel to these latter uh, enlightenment factors. So uh, when the mind is agitated, or if you're thinking too much, just exhaling, just exhale a bit and come back and, and look for this part of the mind, this aspect of bodily tranquility, mental tranquility and mental concentration, that characteristic of non-tumult or uh, quietude and the characteristic of samatha or collectedness and um, gatheredness. The Pali word samadhi uh, comes from the root di or da, which means to place down. So just a setting down. It's the same root as the word dhamma. So the dhamma and samadhi are both letting the mind down, letting go of all of the extraneous and superfluous and all the things that we're juggling, putting a few balls down, please. Uh, just letting things settle. Sung is together. So there's this, uh, the Pali word or the Thai word is ruam, this uh, coalescing, letting the, the breath be a coalescent, coming together and bringing all strands of thought to the breath and then letting those strands of thought just relax. And then you're just with the breath. And then ah is another intensifier, sung, uh, D. So coalescing to an intensification of letting down samadhi. The English word uh, concentration, um, for many people, uh, it just feels too um, pointed. It feels too uh, almost jagged. It feels uh, restrained, constrained, and uh, small. It's like the, the point of a laser. Whereas many of our teachers in the Ajahn Chah tradition talk about samadhi with emphasis on the, the Thai translation of samadhi, which is dang jai man, or the firm foundation, the firm stabilizing of mind. And I think that's a, a broader aspect, a broader perception to work with. We're not necessarily trying to go laser pointed uh, you know, burrow a hole into the tip of our nose, but keeping an eye on our meditation topic, on the breath, that can be at the tip of the nose, can be at the upper lip, can be at the chest, can be in the belly, but keeping a broader awareness. So a nice uh, simile is as if you're on the top of a mountain 
and you're looking out at another range of mountains, the tallest one you can see. And you could just stare intently at that, maybe even get some binoculars or a telescope. That's the laser pointed aspect of uh, concentration with a capital C and uh, that's the pointedness. Or you can pay attention to the whole landscape, but with just the center of your broad view on that topmost peak in the distance. Samadhi. So the final uh, factor of enlightenment uh, is upeka, upeka, uh, which is often translated as equanimity, equipoise, um, or even balance. The root of upeka is quite interesting. Uh, it comes from the root iksh or ik, which means to look. Um, so, um, It's a, a type of, of looking. Upa is, it, it's like the English word up or onto. So it's a, a looking onto or looking over. So it's basically a bit of remove. It's, you've got some balance. Your, uh, the seesaw is at uh, a parallel angle to the ground. It's, it's flat. Um, things are, are balanced. Looking, looking on, looking on to, looking over. And the Buddha said that um, the food, the nutriment, the fuel for uh, unarisen equanimity and the fuel for the increase of arisen equanimity as a factor of enlightenment is, this one is not, it's a bit underwhelming um, because it makes you actually become a bit creative. What's the nutriment? It is paying attention. So yoni soma nasikara, paying wise attention and looking in a discerning way at uh, those things which are a foundation for equanimity. Yeah. So the upeka sambojanga tanya things, the things which are a foundation for equanimity. So Basically, it doesn't really tell you what those are, which is kind of fascinating. The Buddha could have been more specific. He could have said, oh, yeah, paying attention to the Buddha mantra. The Buddha could have said that. He said he could have said, uh, oh, it's paying attention to the Beth breath at the belly or paying attention to the color green or paying attention to uh, an image of your young child, something like this. Um, but it's quite interesting that he didn't. It's basically putting it back on us. What are those things which make us more equanimous, which give us this degree of remove, which give us this capacity to shift out and escape from the limiting narratives that we have. And in the context of the Bojangas, these enlightenment factors, uh, really they are, as we've said, pointing towards collecting and calming of the mind. They're a very good subject for a day long retreat or even for within one meditation session, really just uh, calming. And this quality of upeka or equanimity is said to be purified in the fourth jhana. So that's a pretty deep level of equipoise and equanimity. And we can work to that and we should work to that. And when we've got all this time today, then this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, our lives are short. This day is short. And being able to give attention to, uh, yeah, these things are more and more important. Foundationing the mind and letting the mind go deep are very, very important. But we can also practice this equanimity in daily life, being able to not be moved when people uh, praise us or when people blame us and being able to sit like a mountain, being unmoved by praise and blame and honor and dishonor. This is a form of worldly daily life, quote, daily life, equanimity. And then we can bring that if we practice it during our daily lives into our meditations, just being able to look on more and more. We need to do less and less. That's what the, the jhana factors are about, 
we're basically taking away things which are unnecessary, even when the mind is already very, very settled, very, very calm, very, very quiet. We're just slowly just letting these things fall away and we don't need them. It's an extra weight and it's an, an extra fluctuant of the mind. So we uh, have let go of directed thought and evaluation. When we go from the first to the second jhana, we let go of piti and sukha, this uh, yeah, exhilaration and uh, the ebullience. Uh, when we go from the second to the third and into the fourth jhana, and with the fourth jhana, we basically let go of even the subtle types of liking and disliking. And we're just able to rest with a very calm and just totally content, uh, a totally content watching, fully awake, but totally unmoved, totally cool, super cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. So these are the latter three uh, awakening factors. And each of these appear in other lists. And um, Jean gave us some background uh, about the BIMS, the Bellingham group, your study of these different Bojanga factors. And uh, in just a few minutes, we'll have an opportunity for question and answers for a period. Um, and maybe we can go into more of these different aspects of uh, the Bojangas, all seven of them. Um, and yeah, to think together more about uh, how to practice them, both in our day-to-day -day lives and in our concentration and in our meditation, trying to understand these better and understand the roles they play in the different lists in which they appear. Because yeah, Samadhi, it's both one of the Eightfold Path, Sama Samadhi, it's a, an enlightenment factor. All four of the uh, Idipadas circle around Samadhi. It's one of the five faculties. It's one of the five um, strengths. Similarly, Upeka is the tenth of the Parami. It's the tenth of the, or the seventh of these enlightenment factors. It's the fourth of the uh, um, Brahma Viharas. It's a type of uh, feeling, an equanimous or neutral feeling. And each of these uh, in their different roles have slightly different flavors that we can all uh, think about. So maybe conclude these calming uh, and relaxing words and open things up for um, Q&A. So um, I'm not sure who will be facilitating this. Will this be Jean or? I'm thinking Steve, Steve. Um, okay, great. Um, but Steve should confirm that. Um, what do you think, Steve? That sounds, I'll take that on. Thank you. <laughs> okay, if, if people can uh, use their little yellow hands or else uh, type a question into the chat. Do you want to tell people how to use the yellow hand? So for those who don't know, there's in there's a little button with a smiley face and a little plus sign on it. Um, if you press that, you'll see a raise hand button where you can raise your hand. There's also a little party hat if you feel really happy about things. I don't think that's a party hat. I think it's a it's, like a, one of these things you blow okay, at New Year's. It's one of those things. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. It's okay. It could be a party We haven't hat. been to parties recently. Yeah. It's sorry. been a while. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't know how to make it go away. Okay. Uh, looks like uh, Milan. Okay. <laughs> Milan's got a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, Katie here. We're all we're all doing this day long together, which is really nice. Um, yeah, I had a question. So I have been trying to hold really strongly with with right speech lately. And it's it's gotten to the point where it kind of feels wrong to even talk about someone if they're not around, even if I'm not saying anything disparaging or gossiping. But something that I've been struggling with is 
part of how I process my feelings and um, it was kind of coming up for me when you were talking about Tani Sabo about like this bruising of the heart and I feel like there's been some things lately that have been difficult for me and I usually process those feelings by talking to someone about it and I've been noticing as I've been taking on right speech that I'm I'm keeping all of this inside and I think especially over the past few days it's gotten to a point where it's my mind is like becoming more agitated and there's there's like more more dukkha coming up but I'm trying to find this balance of like how do I how do I share what's going on with me with without maybe naming someone's name or saying too much but also like being able to process so yeah I'm wondering yeah what advice you have for that and yeah it's I guess it's not directly related to the Bajanga, so hopefully that's okay, but it's it's been on my mind the past few days, so thank you. Thank you, Katie. Right speech is such a um, meaningful kind of realm of exploration because so much of our comma is manifest in speech. Um, so it's just a really fruitful realm to work with. And I think that uh, line you're trying to find a route through is a pretty, um, it's just a really healthy investigation. Um, you know, for example, when you enter a monastery, often there's this sort of admonition in Thailand to really not talk. And uh, I just remember being like very serious and, and it, was un it was very awkward. Um, <laughs> There was a monk in Australia who kept you know, sort of like, so you ever watch Australian football? And I was just, like, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, you start to realize that, um, you know, it, there's a reason the uh, fourth precept around um, uh, lying is so specific around lying because wrong speech includes, um, you know, elements of, of harsh speech, uh, you know, device a tail bearing, um, uh, lying, and then uh, idle chatter as well. But the only one that the precept again is against is be, is against um, uh, lying because you can keep that at all times, no matter what. Um, but there actually are times and places where the other three are appropriate. Um, for example, divisive tail bearing. Um, you might need to warn someone about another person. With idle chatter, um, it's sort of a grease that you, or oil that you can kind of oil the wheels of the machine a little bit and keep it moving smoothly. So there's a place for idle chatter too. And you just need to get a feel for when there's so much on the gears that it's kind of gunking it up. Um, and similarly, I mean, with what you're talking about around processing, uh, I think there's a, you know, often you're right, that may mix into divisive tail bearing um, slightly because you are maybe speaking about someone. Um, I think there has to be room for that sort of processing in a life uh, generally, especially for certain character types. Um, you know, you can try kind of writing some of it out a little bit, um, but I think uh, you're right, like it helps to talk things through with others a little. And one thing I found really helpful is um, whenever there comes a point where you need to kind of move into that realm of, you know, quote unquote, divisive tail bearing, either for your own processing or because you're figuring out how to help someone, you know, like um, I just find being very careful with uh, who you speak to, um, you know, having sort of one confidant you feel really secure with, um, and then, you know, making sure you're not moving from a place of reactivity, um, and then really putting strong borders on the conversation, like saying, look, I don't usually uh, like to speak about others. I feel like I need to process something with you. Can we, can we, can I speak to you a little bit? And um, just being as gentle and really focused as you can with that, uh, and aiming towards metta, loving kindness, finding the compassion there. Um, and, I, you know, I have faith enough in your practice that you'll be able to feel, feel when it 
become something else. But all to say, there's, you know, there's never a place for lying on this path, um, which is why there's a precept against it. But there is a place every now and again for finding those carefully controlled circumstances where you can do just that. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's healthy to kind of play with that and to move towards speaking so little about others that you, you know, land, you know, significantly on that side of the line for a while. But I think there has to be a place for that too, to be able to process a little bit. Ajahn. Um, yeah, well said. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And sometimes I forget that the precept is lying because I take it as false, harmful speech and gossip. Mm -hmm. And I take that every morning. And so I've been taking it like very seriously, but that's helpful to know because I've been trying to practice with like, if I really need to process with more detail, like just talking to my therapist or just talking to my mom about it because they don't mm -hmm. know, they don't live like my mom, for example, she doesn't live in Seattle, you know, so she's not going to get more involved with what I'm saying. Um, so that helps me have a little more ease around it because I think I was getting a little maybe tight around it and getting into a place of feeling um, like I couldn't say anything. So that's really helpful. Thank you. That's actually a great strategy, Katie. I hadn't thought of that. It's reaching out to someone kind of a bit farther away at times. That's really wise, I think, actually. And yeah, good. I mean, there's really, there's a lot of beauty in expanding the scope of the precepts or their implications to, you know, to have that their ethic kind of pervade out through your life but um yeah there's there's a reason that they're very specific because you know what they actually point to are things that we can keep universally um and there are times for the other sorts of speech just a, a quick note yeah i mean i think when the buddha does talk about those others define um you know wrong speech as refraining from lying and harsh speech and uh, gossip and idle chatter. I think he means the uh, unwholesome aspects mm. of those, which are always unwholesome. But when they are, you know, coming from, you know, the Buddha would talk to people when they came to visit him, mm. the, the kind of grease, you know, greasing the, mm -hmm. the machine. How are you doing? Are you getting enough food? Um, how have you been? Mm. You know, the Buddha would have this kind of, um, yeah, he doesn't just jump into the Four Noble Truths, you know, first sentence. Mm -hmm. Similarly, as you said, like, when a teacher has to admonish a student mm -hmm. or um yeah or warning someone about a, a dangerous person or situation so yeah, yeah. We, we've both then been through trying to go home and not engage in any idle chatter around the dinner table and it's just really awkward especially since oh, yeah. we can't eat dinner but yeah. it's awkward anyways <laughs> <laughs> so uh maybe we can take the question in the chat from reed yeah do you want me to read it uh, it's okay. We we can. Okay. Um, I often find my major obstacle in meditation is endless doubt. Doubt that my approach and method are correct, that I have the capacity for deep, fruitful meditation, and sometimes even that it's worth the effort of doing, none of which I actually believe uh, on an intellectual level. How can I address this big, big hindrance that has struck with me for years? Um, yeah, I mean... Uh... In that same discourse where the Buddha is talking about the nutriment, the few food, the fuel for uh, the enlightenment factors, he talks about the, the fuel for, for doubt. And uh, he says something somewhat similarly enigmatic that you don't pay attention, you, you don't give wise, you don't give unwise attention to uh, things which are the basis for doubt. So certainly not, you know, paying attention to things which are beyond your control. So um, yeah, the, the future of your meditation technique, um, but also uh, something which is given by, by teachers as a helpful aid to not fueling doubt is to, um, yeah, wise friendship, Kalyana Mitta. And um, that includes you know, what we're listening to and what we're, the media that we're engaged with. And, um, you know, I think that's a big source of doubt for many people. It looks like your doubt is actually about the path. Um, and there, you know, I think what Tanisbo said, you know, you, there's no way 
to the end of doubt through doubt. You know, doubt is just like a, a self replicating echo chamber. Mm. It's just, um, it's, it's your own filter bubble of, uh, proliferation and really you just kind of have to shift into a different mode. The, um, proliferation is not going to, um, you know, trying to intellectually get your way through it, you know, is not necessarily mm. going to work. So maybe shifting to a different mode, seeing if you can tap into like, a well, devotional practice is almost like the, the opposite of a, a doubting temperament. Um, but if you can, if you can do that, sometimes you can fake it till you make it with some of these devotional practices, like, um, you know, the physical balance, the physical gesture of, of bowing, you know, can feel forced and it might for a while actually exacerbate doubts and saying, this is stupid. This is, is this, you know, idol worship is this, you know, what is this? Um, but then if you can just give a little bit more time to it, um, the physical gesture of it can actually just, uh, work through some things and you might find that, or you might find some other kind of physical activity is a good shift. Basically doubt is the mind. Um, yeah, it's thinking without control. It's the opposite of flow, which is, uh, control without thinking. Hmm. So, um, yeah, allowing for the flow states of, um, yeah, which are non-doubt complicated and bodily practices can help with that. Um, I would also say that, uh, yeah, Ajahn Kovilo is a good bower. Um, there's uh, Edabaya Giri. He was one of the few monks who would engage in these full length prostrations and there weren't many places to bow. So I think people would sometimes like open up closets and find them doing devotional practices and it's pretty awesome. Great. Ajahn, yeah. Actually. So. Yeah. If you've been to a bike here, chances are I've bowed in any room that you can imagine. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and, and one other thing is the sutta, which Ajahn Kovilo was mentioning the Ahara Sutta with feeding and starving the hindrances and enlightenment factors is he mentioned the food for doubt. Um, uh, one of the ways it says to starve doubt is uh, to, um, oh gosh, I think it's to know bright and dark states, mm. which always to me implies, um, if any of you watched Ajahn Kovilo's guided meditation on yesterday, he had this thing where you pull back from becoming attached to sights by coming to the sense of the eye. And there's a similar movement there with instead of becoming fixated on the object of doubt, you just see the mind state itself as doubt mm. and name it. And that hamstrings it. It's almost, um, it short circuits it a little bit. So I think that can be helpful. Mm. There's another question in the chat uh, from Robert. Okay. How you can do read it actually, if you'd like, yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, how does one practice through ups and downs of motivation? I feel my motivation to practice changes consistently and feel as though I am cycling between feeling super motivated and just wanting to waste time with useless sense pleasures. Yes, welcome to the club, absolutely. Um, <laughs> the One thing is to realize that our site, our uh, meditations don't always operate on a completely 24 hour cycle. So, you know, often one day you might feel a lot of motivation to meditate. And then the next day, maybe the mind has a sort of afterglow where it wants a bit more um, study or chanting. Um, and then the next day back to meditation. Um, so it's good to acknowledge that, but still having that regularity of practice is, is really important. Ajahn Chah would famously say, if you are motivated to meditate, meditate. If you're not motivated to meditate, meditate. Um, that being said, having a broader conception of what practice can be is really helpful. So if the mind is really hungry and active and you know leaning towards sensual pleasure, then maybe you can give it, uh, expand your conception of practice a little to honor uh, what might be a legitimate energy in it um, through 
say listening to a Dhamma talk as you meditate, um, engaging in some chanting or sutta study. Um, and, you know, the other thing is it can be, uh, you know, also like Longpur Cha said that about 80% of the practice is knowing we should let go of something and not being able to. And there really is a cycle that occurs where, you know, you achieve a state of calm and then you re-enter the world and you feel uh, the burn of it a lot more. Um, and you feel sort of the triviality of what you formerly engaged in. And having some patience as you cycle through that again and again a few times. And only through that kind of continual comparison does the heart release from the burning khandas. And it takes a while and it's not pleasant. Um, and we feel stupid for some of it, but that can help. Um, and then I'd say, but if you do come across certain uh, things you know are just not good for you and you know you're ready to let go of them, there's a quality we call aditana. It's in the paramitas um, determination. And that's the sword that can just cut through some of that thing. So that's when you say, I'm not going to drink anymore. Like I'm done. Um, or, you know, I'm just getting rid of my Netflix account. Um, and if it helps, uh, Monks use this a lot. In fact, the whole vinya, in a sense, is one gigantic aditan, and it covers so many minutiae of life. Uh, but some really helpful ones are um, around right speech. For example, we can't admonish another monk unless we ask permission, unless we are speaking from metta and speaking truthfully. Um, and a good way to keep yourself holding aditana is uh, write a check to a rival political party and give it to a friend and say, tell them that if you break your aditana, you'll they should mail the check. And that's a good way to kind of make sure you stay in line. So, you know, there's a place for that sword. Um, and there's a place for understanding that it takes us a while to move towards the wholesome. I think, but, that, I think that aditana aspect can be really good for doubt as well. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're fluctuating, just use that sword of, uh, strong determination of aditana and say, if you're saying, I, I can't pick a meditation object, just say, okay, I'm just going to use this sword. I'm going to use, I'm going to use the ax onto the chopping block. And for the rest, for the next five minutes, for the next half hour, mm. I'm just going to stay with the breath at the tip of the nose. And what do you have to lose? Um, you know, that's 20 minutes or, you know, is this, uh, is this a good book or is this uh, teaching really helpful? Mm -hmm. Just cut it off. Okay, I'm going to finish this book or I'm going to finish this chapter and then I can reevaluate. But once you kind of make this clarity of decision, mm -hmm. that can be, that can just cut through doubt as well. So that's quite good. Yeah, I don't know if you have any in your chat, but I, I had one personally, uh, might talk about and it, it it's again, I think, I think probably another form of doubt. It's, it's despair, um, which uh, with all the national and world crises and it, it uh, what uh, Ajahn Nisabo talked about this morning about not bypassing, because um, these, these beautiful techniques are very good at um, kind of getting past those kind of things to where I can sit experience the the calm the tranquility um but i don't want to be bypassing um i want to do that uh you know that part of the first noble truth of knowing the suffering well um and uh you know the the, the crises are kind of they, they kind of mock hope um there's there's not a lot to do um so uh, they, they can kind of get into a lot of perseverating. Um, so just kind of how to handle that despair and actually whether it, whether you see that as a, a form of doubt or some other hindrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First, my, my sympathies are, um, you know, I, came back to the US on election night two years ago, and I really saw this change in people from a lot of the news cycle. It was palpable. 
what I would reflect on a little is, um, you know, the world's tragedy, I don't think has really changed. Um, I think the world has been in these difficult straits forever. Um, you know, you look at the time of the Buddha and there were armies clashing around him. One of his most beloved disciples, uh, King Bimbisar was murdered by his son. Um, the commentaries at least say that uh, the Buddha's clan was later, sla later slaughtered. Um, he was accused of this and that way there's disease ravaging. I mean, you know, maybe the child mortality rate is less, um, you know, talked about than headlines, but, you know, there was no less tragedy in the time of the Buddha. And in, in actually it's so many metrics, the world is better than it's ever been. Um, and I find it really beautiful to look at how the Buddha moved through those circumstances um, with utter care and, uh, you know, King Achitasattu, who murdered his father, uh, King Bimbisara, he comes to the Buddha afterwards and the Buddha receives him and teaches him and with, with love. And King Achitasattu is so moved by the end of it. He says, you know, I did something wrong. I killed my father, a good man. And in the end, he's sort of saved. He, um, I mean, he goes to hell afterwards, but uh, later on, he's supposed to become a Pacheka Buddha and uh, he sponsors the first Buddhist council. Um, all to say that I think, you know, recognizing the headlines are not, you know, there's sort of a mantra of stay informed, don't want to ignore what's going on, but we only have so much attention. And like Hegel said, evil lies and evil, evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. Um, the world is not like the headlines make it out. Um, you know, I mean, those things exist, but they always have. And I feel like there's a real place for kind of realizing what we can make a difference in. Um, and often that's local, you know, and uh, Long Propasano sort of advises this is like, take a big step back from a lot of the other news, maybe read a few long form articles every now and again, um, you know, or more if you really feel the need. But, you know, if you're going to focus on an issue, focus on one issue that you can actually make a difference in. Um, you know, and often that'll be local. Um, but I think really understanding that what the world needs so much is what you will carry into it if you if your practice brightens the heart. And and often, you know, as a practitioner, you do see the effect that looking at the news often will have on your heart. And it's it does affect your practice. And I think there's a place for like giving yourself a little space to let the heart gather strength and having faith that what you move back into the world with will influence all those other things in really powerful ways. Um, and uh, all that being said, um, you know, this isn't to advise turning away from uh, social issues and stuff, just to take very seriously the tenor of your heart as a practitioner as well, and um, try to find a balance between those two. And that if you're moving into self-righteousness, indignation and othering, um, you may be looking at too much news because, you know, in the Buddhist conception, the means never justify the ends because the means are the ends. And if you're not able to move in those, to those actions with a sense of care and love, then it probably means that it's worth kind of pulling back a little bit, recentering into that metta place and then moving into the world, maybe. Um, I hope that uh, sounds all, all right. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I have... I, I know a lot of people are in a similar boat, and uh, I understand. Thank you. Uh, Looks like Jason has a yeah. question now. Oh. Jason, you disappeared. What? Was, does I'm that be original? No, he's still here. Oh, yeah, I know you popped away after you lowered your hand, but you can ask your question. OK, great, thanks. I was like, I see myself. Um, <laughs> so. <clears throat> You know, while we're thinking about this, uh, the subject of the retreat, it is, it's occurred to me, like I work a lot with the, um, the factors, right? The five factors or the, um, gosh, I get, I always get confused between the five factors and the seven faculties. So I guess it's the five faculties and the seven factors, right? So I work a lot with the, um, 
with, you know, faith, energy, uh, concentration, sati, and panya. And I overlap a lot with, I infuse my practice a lot with, okay, being very intentional about uh, pasadi uh, into my practice. And, but it occurred to me, like, a lot of these things are when you sit for, you know, you can, I work with a lot of these, like, I calibrate, like, an equalizer so I can get to a, a certain meditative state with the right amount of concentration so I can do dhamma vichaya, et cetera, and start cultivating, you know, dropping questions in there for wisdom. And I, and I, when I have, when I'm on retreat mostly, or I have a, a prolonged sit, I can have uh, feelings of joy and rapture come up. But that's mostly like in a retreat experience. So I guess my question is, I work a lot with all of these. Um, and there, there are a lot of times there are a lot of like, there it's, I can treat them like a verb. Like I can, I can create concentration. I can sustain mindfulness. Um, but one thing I don't think I'm good at, and it's something I think I really need, I don't want to say good at, but it occurred to me that I'm not very good about a rising joy and a rise in pity. And I think that where I'm at in my life right now, while we're talking, I need a lot of that, right? I, I feel a lack of joy in my life. Um, uh, a lot of times when I'm sitting, you know, I'll get a permagrant on my face, my spine, you know, like everything is just in sync. And I feel a lot of that. And, but I'm not very good at verbing pity, like conditioning pity. And I'm wondering if you could provide some uh, help along those lines. Cause I think kind of like in self-diagnosing here, I think I want to focus on that for a little bit. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's great, Jason. And yeah, it's too bad that PTing, pitying just <laughs> sounds so good in English, but. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I probably said pitying. No, oh, no, no. I, I'm just thinking in that way. No, yeah. uh, you make great points and it sounds like you're thinking in some really good ways and framing your, your life and your practice in some really useful ways. Um, seeing how these different lists come together, the Indriya, the five Indriya, the five faculties and the uh, Bojanga, the seven uh, factors of awakening. And yeah, you know, in the um, Anapanasati Sutta, which we began to chant at the beginning of the, the day long, there, you know, there's an active training. So breathing in, one arouses piti, and breathing, uh, and breathing out, one arouses piti, and one knows that uh, there is piti there when you breathe in and breathe out. So it's something which you can do with every in breath and every out breath. And the Buddha doesn't so much expand in that, that discourse uh, as to how to do that. Um, and when the Buddha doesn't really elaborate, oftentimes that can just be an encouragement for us to, to experiment because uh, each of us, there are different things. Like, um, yeah, uh, me imagining my brother when he was, you know, six, you know, brings about pity. It brings about this joy. You know, I can just imagine him. He was, yeah, he's still young and, you know, wasn't all complicated like we all are when we get old, but um, um, yeah, that just brings up joy for me. Or, you know, these are, there's some overlap with meta practice or, you know, you can use a, a puppy to bring about feelings of, of loving kindness. And you can also do that for joy. And so just recognizing it more, becoming more familiar with it, maybe even labeling it, and then just slowly nourishing and kind of stoking that, that uh, growing, that growing uh, little flame of, of pity, of joy, of rapture. And um, yeah, it can get deeper and deeper and more and more uh, until it is rapturous. You know, they, they talk about the, the rapture, as, as you, you mentioned in meditation, which is just like uh, goosebumps or kind of this thrill throughout the body. One other thing to do is just work on other good aspects of the path. One of the sequences, which occurs again and again, uh, was referred to as the paths to Pomoja. Pomoja means gladness. So uh, the Buddha says that when you do X, it gives rise to gladness. And there in different suttas, he fills in X with different things. When one is generous, then that gives rise to gladness. And that gladness gives rise to piti or this joy. And that joy leads to pasadi which is you know, the tranquility, which leads to sukha, which leads to samadhi, which leads to seeing things as they are. So really giving more energy to 
these initial steps. So before, what gives rise to gladness? What are the paths to Pomoja? Uh, generosity, keeping precepts and reflecting on keeping precepts, study and reflecting on your study, uh, being able to look at dukkha from a, a, a normative place that can give rise to um, Pamoja or this gladness, which gives rise to piti. Um, so yeah, there are all these different faith, even, you know, for people who, who've got a measure of faith, faith can give rise to gladness, which gives rise to, to joy. So you can work with both the precursors. And this is another just aspect of, um, yeah, causality and just uh, adding and working with things that precurse and with the factor itself and becoming more and more familiar with it. Yeah, and, and just to quickly add on to that, I think, um, you know, often there's another activity which can really help. And uh, like, I think Ajahn Kovila is one of his most direct, direct routes to that Pomoja is, is study and kind of diving into the suttas. And for me, it's, uh, it's writing and art. And I think there's a lot to be said for bringing that quality of rejoicing um, into the Theravada path, because often we're a, a dour lot on the surface. And I think it's important to you know, we need a big spoonful of sugar. These are pretty um, powerful teachings and it helps to really bring in some joy intentionally. And sometimes figuring out these other means to do that is helpful. We're not actually a dour lot, but we can be in our bad moments. Right. Um, right. Uh, maybe this can be our last question. Daniel. I'm just wondering about, um, I keep asking questions about wise and unwise attention, because I see those phrases when talking about the hindrances and the, um, the bojangas, I think as well. And what I had been doing was basically just really gauging what's happening. Um, like, oh, there is doubt here. Okay, what does doubt feel like? But do I feel it on my body? Does it have a flavor, etc.? But I realized I'm doing pretty much the exact same thing when something positive is present, like joy. Oh, okay, what does joy feel like? Or, or maybe maybe on the lines of what brought this about? And so I'm wondering, um, are those both wise and unwise attention when applied to different things? Um, how do I, is, is that the kind of attention I need to be looking at? Well, I think I know a little of the practice you're working with right now, Daniel. Um, as well. You've talked to me a bit about it um, in terms of a lot of insight. Uh, I, I would say Ajahn Kovilo and I just this morning, we were talking about the, um, I think it's called the Dasutara Sutta, the expanding decades. And it goes into different dhammas to be um, uh, fully known, parinyaya, is that it? Uh, abandoned, uh, realized, and developed. And um, you know, for some of the, say, hindrances or, dar or darker states, I mean, abandoning them. Um, and, uh, you know, also there's a place for that aspect of just knowing them as well as a route to maybe moving past them or letting them go. Uh, you know, uh, one source of mindful or source of power and mindfulness is tidying by naming, um, tidying up by naming. So it's kind of tidying up all those defilements a bit. But for something like pity, um, I mean, it's good to know it and to see what gave rise to it. But for the sake of developing it, um, it's a quality to be developed. So, you know, it's okay to really dive, you know, don't lose yourself, but, uh, you know, keep the breath in the background, stay aware of your body. Um, in every step of the Anapanasati Sutta, there's always the refrain of the breath. You never lose that center. But... Um, you can develop it if it's a recollection of metta or an image or a story. Um, you know, you can imagine getting up early to offer food to the Buddha and really play out a little movie in your head. Um, you know, or Ajahn Jayasar recommends uh, remembering 10 really powerful good acts you've done in your life and spend a 30 minute meditation, spending three minutes on recollecting each act that's Dhananusati, recollection of giving. Um, so really, it's okay just to to really develop that and try to stoke the fire. It's a wholesome fire. And, uh, you know, with sort of dry insight practice, there can be a focus on just stepping back, stepping back, stepping back, and it can get kind of dry. So it's, it's useful to realize that um, 
we don't have a choice but to feed on pleasure and to be addicted to something. We're already addicted to sensual pleasures. Um, you know, there's this sort of conceit that if we stay far back from everything, we'll stay unaddicted. But what happens is you just kind of end up curled up in this sort of crystallized numb ball. Um, so if you can feed, find something very wholesome and beautiful to, you know, nourish you, then that's good. And it's okay to kind of develop it. So yeah, I'd say some things would be known and abandoned and others know them and develop them, you know. Ajahn? Just real quick, Daniel. Uh, I know you're, I think you're maybe reading uh, Buddha Dhamma as well. You could skip ahead, maybe in chapter 13 or something like that. There's a whole chapter on Yoni So Manasikara, the wise attention, mm. and it is awesome. Pia Paiuto does the best job of anyone I've ever seen in any language, um, basically collate and bring all the different methods or many of the different methods and name them that the Buddha used to uh, to wisely reflect to Yoni So Manasikara. So it's a fun chapter. Okay, I think we have uh, an hour of meditation, is it? Um, yes, 2 to 3 p.m. Um, so maybe we'll just, uh, yeah, people can sit and walk as they will. Uh, and we'll meet back here at around 3 p.m. Does that sound good? Yep. Uh, good. Uh, Steve, is that all right? Gene, yes? Okay. Recording in progress. So I think we have another half an hour for Q&A. If people would like, um, you can raise your hand or type things into the chat. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Steve, is that sound about right, Gene, Steve? Yeah, that's that sounds right. And since I don't see any yet, echoing. Um, I, I know Vito and Alio, uses uh, um, equipoise when he's talking about the seven factors and equanimity in the Brahma Baharas and elsewhere. And um, I remember hearing an explanation at some time, but I, I've, I've forgotten it and I've kind of tried to put it back together myself, thinking the, uh, uh, here, here it might be more the Kind of a balancing factor, the, the reason for using poise in the seven factors, and elsewhere it might be more the the big picture, the the, the broad look at things that make it uh, more appropriate to use equanimity. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, Steve. I I had I hadn't realized that. I mean, um, yeah, different translators have different principles. Um, I know some translators, like I think <clears throat> Bhikkhu Bodhi, who's a wonderful translator, will usually try to stick with one translation for one per word in general context. So I think Bhikkhu Bodhi tra translates uh, um, Upeka as equanimity, both when it's a Brahma Vihara, a divine abiding, and in this context of the uh, alignment factors, and I think also in the context of the 10 parami. But I, I think it's fascinating when translators do choose to make that decision to translate things differently, depending on the context. I mean, one other instance, one other occasion where you find the word upeka in the suttas is uh, in as one of the vedana, so as one of the feeling tones. So you've got uh, the hedonic tone, the vedana of sukha, the hedonic tone of dukkha and the hedonic tone of adukkha masukha, which is sometimes called upeka. And there, sometimes um, translators will translate upeka in that context as neutrality. And I think that makes sense because um, the upeka of the feeling tone is not something which is necessarily to be developed, but something which is to be known. So this is. Um, like hopefully people will be familiar with 
Tan Nisabo brought it up uh, earlier, but the, the duties towards each of the Four Noble Truths. So Dukkha is to be understood, Parinyaya, and the Second Noble Truth of the cause is to be abandoned, and the uh, Niroda, or the cessation of Dukkha, is to be realized, and the path is to be developed. So equanimity as a enlightenment factor, and as a parami, and as a brahma-vihara are all to be developed. Those are all part of the fourth noble truth, whereas upeka of uh, the Vedana is to be, is to be known, is to be uh, appreciated uh, in that sense. And so, yeah, um, I think translating things in different contexts, and um, I thought it was fascinating. Gene had sent us some questions before uh, we began and just asking about the difference of flavor between um, yeah, upeka as a Brahma Vihara, upeka as a uh, factor of enlightenment, and upeka as a, um, a, a parami or a spiritual um, accomplishment or perfection. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, there are different flavors. Did you think any more about that? Or does anyone in the group have more thoughts on that? Or? I could just say on um, with the translation equipoise, uh, mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate it um, because I think the greatest danger of equanimity is, um, you know, it being uh, lumped in with a certain quality of apathy or callousness. And um, as Ajahn Sona kind of points to the danger of that and poise, uh, looking at the Brahma Viharas, the boundless abodes, especially as, um, you know, equanimity in this context as, you know, movements and um, of say a dancer and that moment of poise when a dancer kind of <coughs> pauses between two movements um, and there's, a, there's an utter aliveness in that moment and a sensitivity <laughs> suddenly to context, looking at the audience, feeling where they are in the whole movement of the piece and then they move. And for me, that paradigm has been so helpful along with the idea of equanimity as looking closely um, when interacting, say with family um, or with a situation where you can't apply any of the other Brahma Viharas. Uh, I visit my sister sometimes and um, she's a wonderful person but she lives a quite different life than me. She works at YouTube at Silicon Valley. And uh, when, you know, as many of you know, when you're with family, um, there's so many old Sankara. And I find the most skillful way I've found to interact with, with, with family in, in the sense is uh, looking closely for those, because there's so much other noise and past Sankara and programs and habits. So like really looking closely for those few moments where you can touch something real between all those, like the cracks. And um and, and I just find that there's, you know, those few moments every trip where I actually get to sit down with my sister one-on-one -on -one at a table or go on, you know, a walk or just a few moments that make all the difference. And I, I find that sense of poise and waiting and watching closely. There's such care in that and vibrancy and listening and real love. Um, and it's not callous. And I find equipoise to be the best translation I've ever heard along with um, watching closely, just from my own practical experience, I, I really appreciate it. Mm. Yeah, Ajahn. yeah. One more thing, just mentioning uh, dancers. I mean, in the context of a Brahma Vihara, um, you know, it's said that equanimity is abundant, exalted, immeasurable, mm -hmm. without hostility and without ill will. So that's a, it's an equipoise or an equanimity which is boundless. You know, people often say that the near enemy of uh, equanimity is is apathy mm. and just pointing out that aspect of the abundancy the mm. abundantness mm. of uh, equanimity in that context i think is really helpful and if we could come up with a better word that would be great i'm sorry, I'm sorry Jean. you had uh i think you had your little your hand up i did um partly because it's connected to what you're talking about i i had told the ajahn that um Ajahn, that our group had had a discussion having listened to an Ajahn Sona uh, talk on equanimity. And, and he described it as um, a balance between um, a cool mind and a warm heart. And 
he also said that passion is highly overrated. <laughs> and I think everyone liked the first part, but yeah. passion is highly overrated, raised a lot of questions. And it partly could just be a definition of passion, but um, passion would be maybe the other end from apathy. But I'm re I mean, I, this is sort of maybe tagging on to Steve's question, like one cultivates equanimity, but where is the how is the action part? Where is the action part of that? Um, I think, Tan Isabo, your suggestion that we pick one thing and what we'll work locally is helpful. But anything else you can um, talk about in terms of passion and equanimity or you know, joy of life and equanimity or you know, whatever. So I think it's just useful to point out that, you know, the Buddha taught, there's two roots to truth in Christian theology. There's apophatic and cataphatic method. So apophatic method is articulating God and truth by what it's not. And cataphatic is articulating God and truth by what it is. And the Buddha is the most strictly apophatic teacher in some sense, I think history is almost ever known um, in the sense that, you know, he saw his teachers, you know, this danger of meditation where you encounter a new bright state and it's so, you know, maybe it's the best thing you've ever experienced and it's almost impossible not to attach to it and take it as the ultimate. And the Buddha saw all of his teachers get stuck. Um, Alara Kalama, Udaka Ramaputta, they all took you know, these formless states is the ultimate. So his teaching was brutally apathetic, apathetic, where he said, let go, let go, let go. What you come to when you let go of everything, I'm only going to kind of, hint, you know, I'm going to call it Nibbana, the cessation of greed, hatred, and delusion. But he didn't talk about it in really concrete terms because, well, you can't. And if you do, you do risk reifying and attaching to these states that aren't worthy and um so all to say that a lot of the teachings couched in terms of what we let go of um passion for example <clears throat> and there is this intuition that if you let go of passion what's left you know there's this intuition of kind of a cold blank nothingness numbness lack of movement but you have to realize like you know, the Buddha was teaching this in the context of a culture with this deep, you know, a, a deep sense of metta of, um, you know, a past in uh, a theology, which talked about this sort of pervading divinity. So yeah, the Buddha moved towards emptiness of self, but um, full of reality, full of, you know, divinity, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's a problematic term in Buddhism, but all to say that, um, what you let go of with passion, um, you know, the term in Pali is viraga, dispassion, and it means the discoloring, the um, fading of color. And I think, you know, it's important to see like what you come to when you let go of that sort of passion isn't this emptiness. It's, if you watch a video of Long Port Shah, he's one of the most alive, joyful people you'll ever meet. Um, but it's the sense of raga, lust coloring it's exaggerating it's the getting drunk on something it's um that quality this the hot and sweaty aspect as Ajahn Sona put it um it's sort of like Plato's prisoner kind of taking you know realizing that like they're painting the side of the cave with all this color and you know all these colored muds and dispassion is turning away and walking to the entrance into sunlight um so all to say that, you know, what you, it's the sense of feeding off of this coloring, getting drunk on something. And when you let go of that, you don't come to an apathy, you come to a, an extreme vibrancy and a, a more subtle joy. Um, you sort of walk into that field outside of the cave. And I think it's hard to articulate exactly what that is because the Buddha was so careful about articulating it in very concrete terms for good reason but it's it's not nothing and it's not dead and it's not you know um callous or apathetic apathetic at all 
Ajahn? Yeah, I mean, just for another perspective, and that's that's beautiful. You know, the um, the passion, you know, nibbana, mm -hmm. the goal of our path, you know, is sometimes defined as viraga, which unfortunately in English is, you know, the complete dispassion. But it could also be, you know, translated as the the ultimate coolness. And I think it is a bit of a, a language problem. Um, you know, and you could also translate the word chanda as passion. And chanda is basically the wholesome desire, which is part of the path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So all of the idipadas or bases of success, which are, there are four of them, and they're part of the wings to awakening, along with the seven enlightenment factors and the five, fac the five uh, faculties, which we had mentioned earlier. Um, these are things which you develop. So you basically uh, cultivate this, cultivate desire, cultivate passion. Um, the whole the definition for right effort is one generates desire, one generates chanda, one generates passion, um, uh, activates persistence, arouses and exerts intent for the arising of unarisen wholesome qualities and for the increase in fulfillment of already arisen wholesome qualities. And they generate desire, generate chanda, generate passion for the non-arising of unwholesome qualities or the abandonment of unwholesome qualities that have arisen. So I think in that sense, there is a role for, um, for passion. Mm -hmm. There's the word dhamma chanda. It's like a passion, you know, a wholesome desire to practice the dhamma. And in terms of, yeah, passion, how it's usually used um, in an American setting, have, being passionate about a, a social cause. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's a role for equanimity in that type of passion is to look at it and say, yeah, is this, is this wholesome passion? Is this uh, wholesome desire? Is this chanda? Or is this the raga, the unwholesome desire? which Tan Nisabo was pointing to, which is mm. really not part of the path. And, and you might see it fluctuate, you know, you, your desire, you know, your passion for uh, working for, you know, an, uh, an amelioration of climate change on a local level. You might look at it one day and it might be totally wholesome. This is very cool. This is a very serious danger that we need to take, uh, need to take responsibility for. And you might see it from a very cool hearted place, you know, that, cool heart, um, cool mind, warm heart place. Um, and then the next day, or maybe later that day, when you're on the phone with your senator and they're talking about how climate change isn't real or whatever kind of excuse people have, that, that might switch. You know, Your passion might flip into the um, unwholesome passion of I'm right, you're wrong kind of mentality. And I think we just have to be uh, careful and like walking this balance of, and really being honest with ourselves. It's not the case that my passion is always right because my view is right. I mean, I might, you know, maybe I'm right about my causes. You know, it is, it is a true statement that this cause is worthwhile and the, the opposite is dangerous. That might be accurate, but how are we relating to that? Is our passion leading towards uh, peace for ourselves and for, for the world? Or is it really the type of passion which is just a fire which uh, leads you know, to us ablaze and leads to uh, this contact of fieriness and the things that we touch? And it really can change from moment to moment and, and really being rigorously honest with ourselves. It's not, it's not so much the issue that this amendment is good or bad, or this cause is good or bad, but how are we relating to it? That's where the passion that we have to look at. And yeah, keep checking yourself. Um, did you want to say more, Jean? Or I think um, Angela popped on with a question for a moment. I, I just want to say that not only do I appreciate, appreciate the content, like how you responded to the question, but the spirit that you responded is like, sort of showing us what that looks like i mean you are even and warm-hearted and cool-minded and um and um so the 
the delivery was as um, meaningful as the content. And I just want to thank you for that. Really nice, Jean. And if ever I can be the cool heart and you can be the warm, warm, <laughs> or whatever, we can, we can take turns. If, we, if one of us gets it wrong, we can balance the other one out. Yeah. You know, and it is, um, thank you, Hachan, and thank you, Jean. Um, and there's a real beauty on this. You, you know, we are passionate about the Dhamma and the world needs that, um, you know, and, and you, so many of the other passions and causes, a lot of them, they do have this dichotomy built in where there's an other. And I just find the beauty of the spiritual path is you really can connect with people across the aisle in a really deep way. And, and that's, I think, what the landscape needs more than anything. Um, so, you know, we do get to be passionate, but I think those two terms Ajahn Kobila brought up of Raga versus Chanda, that's really an important distinction between the two types. One's more cons consuming serotonin process. One is like producing and creating uh, mm -hmm. purpose. Dopamine. Um, do we have any other questions? We're moving the laptop so we aren't always staring off slightly to the side of all of you. <laughs> yeah, Angela, did you have a question or? Yeah, hi, venerables. Um... I, my question has actually completely changed from its original form <laughs> um, with uh, this discussion on raga and passions and desire. I think it's something that I'm wrestling with currently. Um, just to give some personal background, like my best friend is like the speaker at this blockchain conference that we're at these couple of days. And it's so cool. It's like web three, it's like the new version of the internet. And I think old pre-Buddhist Angelo would have like just dove in and um, it's really, I can feel that desire of like, oh, and that excitement. I like, I wanna leverage this technology for social good and social justice. And um, I, it reminded me of the metaphor that Ajahn Kovila was saying the other day about all the animals tied together. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm just trying to stay like focused in the Dhamma and, um, but there is like this cheetah that's like trying to chase after this, uh, like all these projects and all this inspiration that I have from the conference and it's painful. It's like that pulling, it's like, it's, it's tail is like, it's almost physically painful and mm. uh, causing a lot of suffering. So I just wanted to see if anyone else had a kind of experience that pain and try to like not chasing raga and um if you guys had any advice not right off the bat do you yeah i think tanisabo and i both ordained before web 2 even so web 3 is a bit beyond us but in terms of the pain of the pain of chasing i mean yeah you 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 do see that like yeah the, the pain of chasing and the, the pain of kind of the opposite of, of pushing away and uh, um, just kind of like this hedonic treadmill, you know, what it's called is, is basically the, the pathway of addiction is like, you just get um, the highs get higher and you just want and become habituated to um, faster and faster things and um, more and more um, exciting things. And um, I don't know if that's, what you're experiencing but yeah that can feel exhilarating when we're able to like stay on top of that wave but then when it crashes you know we're six feet underwater and um and the waves just keep coming and so i, I think this day long and i think these seven factors of awakening are just a great practice to keep working on and and maybe for both sides of, the, of, of this, when you're excited working on the, you know, giving attention to the calming factors. And uh, similarly, when, um, yeah, when you're underwhelmed about things, you know, just arising um, interest more again. So, yeah, thank you, Ajahn. I think that's really true. And, um, you know, I also think just uh, sometimes that sort of naming 
the craving that's below the suffering. Cause if there's suffering, then you can find the craving. Um, and you know, it doesn't mean you don't continue with the action, but you can actually parse out a little more what's happening. So just applying some of those lists the Buddhas gave, like is which sort of, uh, is it bhava tanha craving to become? And can you feel what that leap forward feels like how it's the power in it? Um, is it we bhava tanha the, the craving not to become, to lose yourself in something? Um, is it sensual desire or, you know, that sort of becoming probably maybe, maybe not. Um, is there a sense of fear about if you miss out, you know, and just naming it and seeing the feel of the self coming forward in such stark relief. There's a lot to be learned. And, um, you know, in the end, you probably know what you need to do on a dharmic level day to day right now. It's not like that is probably really in question, at least for most, it isn't. Um, but if you can kind of parse out that larger narrative of what you're learning from just what you do day to day, then that can be a really powerful experience, I think. And, you know, you're to see the self emerge so full formed, it's, it's pretty impressive. And Web 3.0, I'm sure, provides opportunity for that. So, yeah. Hope you can tame the cheetah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and meta replaced with two Ts, perhaps. Meta. Um, Milan. I was or, thinking about that actually creating like a meta token. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my question is related to uh, something you brought up earlier in the Q&A, Ajahn Kogolo, um, around in the context of the Bojangas, uh, equanimity being something that is to be developed um, rather than uh, observed. And I was just wondering if that was the case for the, the other of the seven Bojangas. Are they more uh, things to be developed or are there some that are more uh, supposed to just be noted and uh, things that rise naturally? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, in the concept, all of the uh, bojangas are bhave tabba. They are to be developed, to be cultivated, to be brought into being and increased. Um, so yeah, each of them are. But then even in, in their own context, you know, as we've mentioned, um, you do have to balance it, you know, and um, sometimes you might want to be giving more attention to developing more the active ones than the passive ones and letting the passive ones just um, remain at their level of, of development. Um, so yeah, that's a, a quick, a quick answer. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, just that sometimes developing can be, you know, in the Anapanasati Sutta, a lot of the trainings are to become sensitive to so to remember that that's a form of effort and development is to become sensitive to the taste of something, to give attention to it. Um, hmm. It's a, a different paradigm, but uh, it's, it's valid. Skylar. Hi. Uh, first, thank you both for being here today. I've found this retreat very useful. Um, thanks for having us. So thanks for that. <laughs> um, my question is around the practice of walking meditation. Uh, I haven't spent as much time out of retreat practicing that as I have a formal seated, med seated practice. Um, and I think a lot of that is because I don't have a lot of tools or techniques to make walking meditation maybe more fun. Um, so I was wondering if you had any, anything that you both like to do or, uh, use while walking. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's really good. You know, people, when they start getting interested in meditation, will oftentimes, you know, it's so easy to, um, to take, I'm not saying you have this, but if, you know, if someone has money and you can just go on Amazon and you get, people get excited about meditation, you buy a meditation cushion and you buy Zafu and a Zabaton and maybe a meditation bench and all these other accoutrements of sitting meditation. But then a lot of people do um, kind of neglect like just the setup for walking meditation and just finding a place um, in their house. You really don't need that much. So every monastery, every forest monastery that Taniso and I have lived in, in America and in Thailand, every monk has their own hut 
and every hut has its own walking meditation path. And most of the walking meditation paths at a monastery in our Thai forest tradition are between 20 and 30 paces roughly on average. Um, but really, I mean, I think Tanisbo and I both have done walking meditation in, you know, a 10 by 10 room. So you're going at the, at the diagonal, you know, or, you know, in uh, a square shaped um, configuration. And yeah, so just finding, finding a place and uh, um, whether it's a hallway or a particular track that you have in your room or in your backyard or in a, a park nearby, I think that can be really good. And just not um, denigrating it in your own mind, the not belittling uh, and thinking that walking meditation isn't as much of a, a real practice. It's not the real thing. It's not real formal meditation because you know, when the Buddha talked about purifying the mind and, and practicing bhavana, uh, he said you can do it in any of the four postures, which are standing, sitting, lying down, and walking. So, so yeah, figuring out how to do it and make it fun. So um, there is one book I know of called Walking Meditation by Ajahn Yanadamo. And he mentions a couple of different techniques. One which is big in the forest tradition is just uh, a different a certain word, a meditative word with each right foot and left foot. So he suggests a really simple one, which is a Thai forest go-to is bud on the right foot and toe on the left foot, bud, do, bud, do, bud, do, which basically means awake, 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 awake. And for myself, I've got a slightly longer mantra, which is actually 10 times two length long. Because basically, Budo, you can come become a bit um, inured to just one word, and kind of your mind can space out while part of your other, part of your mind is counting the steps and being aware. So these are all words which are meaningful to me. So basically, right foot, but to dham mo sang go anicca ta dukkha ta anatta ta, like this dukkho samuda yo niro do mug go. So. Basically, the triple gem, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, the three characteristics, impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness, and not self, and then the four aspects of the Four Noble Truths. And yeah, the words don't matter so much. Um, if you do like tradition, um, you can use experiment with some of these, uh, but also just finding something which is just meaningful for you, whether it's English or some other language, not so important. Um, and yeah, honestly, um, another really good book on walking meditation is by Ajahn Liam, L-I-A-M or L-I-E-M, depending on the spelling. But I think he's got a book called Walking. If you look up Walking Liam, you'll find it. But basically, he just talks about walking for pleasure. And just basically, if you're walking and keep the mind balanced, that that in itself is a meditative practice. And he just really, I mean, he's held in the highest regard in our, our sanghas, our communities, and has really cultivated his mind to a superlative degree. And um, so that's a book really worth looking at. And also, of course, the Pieces Every Step by Thich Nhat Hanh. So these are all um, good resources. And then just experimenting and um, talking with your friends about it and seeing what tricks they use, because... Um, yeah, or if your friends don't do walking meditation, then <laughs> hang out with Dhamma people more. <laughs> uh, admit, admittedly, um, the BIMS group that I've recently been hanging out with has a, a walking meditation day that I haven't frequented yet. So I'm going to do that. Nice. Um, but thank you. That was helpful. And for the BIMS day, I mean, there are different types of group walking meditation. You can, at the city of 10,000 Buddhas, they do it like in this long line. It's like this long conga line. And it's not just a conga line around the four corners. It's like this snake that like kind of like walks, you know, s s they crawl. They don't walk. <laughs> yeah. Basically just crawl, you know, like um, slither, slithering. Yeah. Around the, not in their bellies. But, um, yeah. Or you can just do everybody disperse and you know walk on your own, find your own path, um, 
or just huge circles. That's what Ajahn Jaya Saro does, basically outside, um, going, finding a big park and suggesting everyone take their shoes off and walk in a line in barefoot. And um, so, yeah, there are all these different methods. And so cool, Skylar, I'm glad you and, and BIMS that you've all got that resource. So um, thank you, Ajahn. Um, I think that's speaking of walking meditation, if people want to, we have another, I'd say 26 minutes um, of meditation one way or the other, sitting or walking. And we'll meet back here at 4 p.m. to uh, have a sort of final closing half an hour. Um, does that sound about right, uh, Gene and Steve? Okay, thumbs up. <laughs> Good. Recording in progress. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanggang namasami So there's a sutta where the, it's called the Avija Sutta, ignorance. In the Anguttara Nikayas, the numerical discourses. And in it, the Buddha says, uh, because a beginning point for ignorance cannot be discerned. Nonetheless, one can say uh, ignorance has its nourishment, its uh, source. And what is that source? Um, the five hindrances. And what is the source of the five hindrances? The three forms of misconduct. And what is the source of the three forms of misconduct? Uh, lack of restraint of the senses. And what's that source? Lack of mindfulness and alertness, which is caused by lack of appropriate attention, which is caused by lack of conviction, which is caused by lack of hearing the true Dhamma, which is caused by not associating with the wise. And then the Buddha says, and clear knowing and release have their source. And what is that source? The seven factors of awakening. And what is the source of the seven factors of awakening? The four foundations of mindfulness, which is caused by uh, the three forms of right conduct, which is caused by restraint of the senses, mindfulness and alertness, uh, appropriate attention, faith, hearing the true Dhamma, beautiful friends, association with the wise, Kali and Amitta. And what I love about the sutta is in it, the Buddha traces this thread from the ultimate right back to who we are with, the people sitting next to you right now. If you're alone at home, then the people sitting here with you. And as we begin this project, um, Clear Mountain, as we grow this community um, in the Northwest of practitioners, as you step into this group, you know, really paying attention to how we put in the causes of that, um, you know, what Katie was saying on the question today about, you know, learning to walk those lines with right speech. Um, you know, it's all good to uh, speak poetically about community, but the guidelines and the uh, admonitions the Buddha put into place around how we develop this beautiful friendship, this Sangha, um, are so important to pay attention to. 
Uh, I remember a quote from one of Ursula Le Guin's books where she said, um, there's great power and in innocence for good, but no power in it against evil. And what I love so much about the Buddhist Vinaya, the code, is it's, it's the code against evil. It's the, um, you know, we love the high wind, wisdom teachings, but then the Buddha also gives us these day-to-day -day practicalities of restraint, um, how we act with one another, how we hold that space with care so that those beautiful qualities can manifest and um, the darker forces of the heart don't creep in. And one of my favorite suttas for that is called the Kosambiya Sutta, um, where the Buddha speaks about the need for a community to um, the six conditions conducive to harmony, including, you know, behaving or keeping, uh, acting with love and kindness towards one's fellows in the spiritual life and body, speech, and mind, uh, keeping virtue in tune with others, uh, not partaking of offerings without having sharing, sharing them first, and then shared right view, a purpose. So, you know, we can pay special attention to some of those, the admonition against uh, wrong speech. And really, as we, you know, watch these, this community form, this uh, family, to make it part of the culture that, that gossip is not um, something we do, that we are very careful in our speech around each other, um, how we behave in that way. And, you know, these aspects of generosity, of giving, um, of stepping towards one another with an, an ethic of really trying to care. But what I think is so interesting here is the sixth part of that sutta that the Buddha says is conducive to communal harmony, shared right view. And for me, this comes down to shared, uh, largely shared purpose, or at least it's resonant with that. And so often, you know, we can get tied up in these questions around, uh, you know, um, what does it mean to become dispassionate for one thing and another? Um, what does that mean for our own happiness and well being? And, you know, we can offer, um, different justifications for the Buddhist path in that way, you know, pointing to what enlightened beings look like. And it's, uh, you know, the joy that's so visible on their faces, um, what it means to fall in love in the spiritual sense of, uh, you know, the first time I met Long Porpasano and what that love feels like. And it is a love, uh, what it means to bow, you know, what, what's, comes forward to replace the coarse passion in the sense of beauty, um, a love, and you know, more this ethic of uh, stepping away from feeding off the world and one into blessing the world. But in another sense, I feel like that misses the core part of an important part of the conversation, which is that in some sense, that conversation never ends. Um, as monks, um, I can say that, you know, you can debate forever about what would be best for your own happiness. Um, whether or not you know it deep in your heart, it's easy enough to get tied up into knots around, uh, it would be, you know, maybe I could do more good in a different capacity. And it's a never ending story. That's an arithmetic that never adds up. And so instead of that language of rights, of happiness, of what's best for us, I think there's something to be said for putting that all down and asking the real question of what is our duty in this life? What is our purpose? What do we bow to? Because in, this, in the end, this world is hard and it's broken in a very real sense. And though light shines through the cracks, and though there's a deep and powerful uh, goodness running just below the surface if we look for it, and those are very real things. In another sense, there's a place to acknowledge this teaching, not as some, you know, uh, as sort of secular mindfulness movement would have it, um, 
you know, a means of just cultivating health and well-being and lowering your blood pressure. But we have been given something deeply precious that it is our duty to steward forward into the future. And we know that to live a life uh, worthy of our deaths and to, um, to embody our true purpose, what we need is a duty, a purpose worthwhile enough to ennoble and make noble this realm and this difficult uh, life that we do live. So that's the ethic of bowing, of bowing to something and orienting our lives time and again towards this path and understanding it as a great treasure we've been given and how can we give it back to the world? How can we embody it and honor the teacher, the Buddha, all of our those who have come before us over millennia by giving our lives completely to this, because all those other passions, which we've been talking about, they're all symptoms of the heart fracturing itself because it hasn't yet found a stream bed deep enough to hold its entirety. And the Dhamma and the goal of complete awakening are the only stream bed that is that large and can take that breadth of heart. And I remember, uh, you know, that doesn't require ordaining for every person, but I remember that um, first moment where my life really aligned with the Dhamma. And there was such a relief in not having to fracture myself and uh, anymore because there was something that was worthy of my love. And um, yeah, this is a path of brightness, of love, of giving and of duty. And uh, that's, that's a gift. There's a great quote by uh, Tagore. Um, I dreamt that life, um, I dreamt and thought that life was a joy. I woke and found that life was a duty. I acted and behold, duty was a joy. So I think that's a good paradigm. Um, so it's a, you know, a real blessing to uh, move into this year, these decades, um, this place with a growing community of people who seem dedicated to something very similar with such sincerity. And that community, um, that ethic, that purpose, that grounding will be the ground from which all these more subtle and beautiful qualities, the seven factors of awakening, uh, the Brahma Viharas, all these things grow, but we're planting and preparing the garden together. And uh, that is a worthy purpose for a life. So I'm Ajahn Kovi and I both are deeply grateful to have made the connection once again with BIMS and this other kind of wider circle of the community. Um, and we hope that that conduit and friendship continues to deepen. And um, one thing I find is very useful uh, at the end of these retreats is just to let people talk a bit um, about their own experiences uh, with retreat, um, what they're, you know, what this brings up for them. Um, and there's just so, something very settling and grounding about people getting to speak instead of us just talking at you for a day. So uh, if people just want to raise their hand and uh, we'll call on you and just um, you can say whatever the day's brought up or what your feelings and thoughts are. I think we have about, about 10 minutes. Raise your virtual hand uh, because we won't be able to see you otherwise. There's a long line of people that we can't quite see. Oh, that made it a little better. Matthew from Darrington, I believe, or Rock, Rockport. <laughs> yes, Darrington. Thank you, Venerables. Um, just to say very briefly, um, in response to your closing, um, that that really, really moved my heart, really resonated. I don't know quite what that means, but um, I sure felt it. So thank you.
yeah, there's something kind of shallow about the language of happiness. For me, the language of purpose was always much more meaningful. Angela. I also just want to say thank you so much for ha having this today. I always feel like this huge lightness of heart whenever I join the Clear Mountain discussions and meetings. Um, and today I really need it. So much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Janice. Hello, Tani Sibo, and again, and it's uh, nice to meet you, uh, Ajan Kovilo. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to tell you, um, uh, Tani Sibo, I, I, I don't think I've heard it better explained um, when you answered Steve's question about despair. Mm -hmm. um, and just I, I, a big part of my life is working on bridging the political divide and um, and working against othering. And so I just wanted to tell you, I, I wish I could contain that and just take it with me every day. It was beautifully said. Thank you so much. Thank you. And and yeah, there's a real beauty in that. Um, you know the. Uh, it's interesting in America, the one apolitical institution where people meet is Dolly Parton concerts, where like truckers get to stand next to drag queens. And uh, that shouldn't be the case. There should be other places where people can come together. And as a monk wandering, um, it's very interesting. Like, you know, these meditation groups tend to lean a little more liberal. Um, and, but that's not who you find necessarily just supports you on Tudong. Like it's often you know, very, uh, you know, fundamentalist Christians, Mormons, everyone will come forward. And uh, yeah, this is the meeting place of the heart. And that's what, that's what we really need, I think, more than anything. And it's a folk, it's a great focus on the common ground that we all have, which is much greater than our differences, I think. Yes. Thank you so much. Closing little talk there on uh, purpose was really touched me, and um, and it, it's it kind of got back to my my question. It's it's something that I've uh, felt at times in the past when I've um, spent time at a monastery or or um, a long retreat. Is that um, th there is kind of an answer there to the despair. Um, that I mentioned before, and um, mm -hmm. um, and it, it it does it does need a purpose, and it's kind of going there. So I'll listen to it again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a real ethic of um, you know, life's a bit like riding a bike. If it's just kind of slow, it gets wobbly and falls over. Like it, it's only sustainable if you really know where you're pointing and. I have the same thing. Monasteries help so much going to them. Yeah. Christy. Yes, I just want to thank you both so much for the teaching and presence today. And um, and also, I additionally want to um, thank you for making available the daily morning meditations. It's so nice for me. It, it falls right into the great time for my time zone. So very grateful to have it. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's great seeing you there every morning. We got uh, a crew of us who are going strong almost every day. So my time won't always be my own like this, but it is this much. So <laughs> yeah. well, it's great. It's great having you. And yeah, you. it's a nice group. Those who want can jump on meditation with Ajahn Kobilo every morning at 5 a.m. on Zoom. The links are on the website. Marty. 
sorry, uh, trying to mute, unmute myself. I, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I've been pretty quiet recently, so it takes a little bit to have a voice here, but I wanted to say thank you. And um, I really appreciated the kind of analogy you said at the beginning where uh, uh, about needing to learn how to build a boat and kind of the structure that you've provided today. Um, as I'm trying to get back into practice, it's been really helpful, so. Thank you. Okay, so um, unless someone else is interested in speaking, um, I just, you know, wanted to um, really thank um, Steve and, and Jean uh, for putting this together and Bellingham Insight in reaching out uh, despite all the, I believe Jean has COVID right now and is still managing to host this. Um, thank you, Jean. And, uh, yeah, Ajahn Kovan and I both have just so appreciated getting to touch into this group um, over the last few months, and we hope to much more often. And um, yeah, for those who have a chance to stop by Seattle, it'd always be great to see you. Um, I think we usually like to end things with, uh, we'll pass it off to Gene and Steve at the very end. But before that, um, we wanted to dedicate the goodness of today, um, as we often do, to those that you want to keep in mind or bring to mind who are struggling, who have passed. Um, so if people have names that they'd like to bring up right now, then we can remember them together. I just, uh, I suppose, unmute and just say their name. It should be fine. Emily Grace. Uh, Florence. Emily Grace and Florence. And you can say what, what we should sort of wish for them, if you'd like, as well. Safety and ease. Safety and ease. Jean, a swift recovery for you and your family. <laughs> and likewise for our friend, John Graber. <laughs> John Graber. Ajahn Kovilo and I have a friend whose uh, aunt was killed in the recent shootings and just want to spread care to her and her family. Any others? Peace and ease for Patrice. Patrice, peace and ease. Improved health for Kevin. Okay, improved health for Kevin. Hope okay. for Mike. Hope for Mike. All right, okay. So we'll screen share and just chant together and bring those to mind or anyone else you'd like. Now let us chant the verses of sharing and aspiration through the goodness that arises from my practice. May my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world, May the highest gods and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, may those who are friendly, indifferent, or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life. 
May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless through the goodness that arises from my practice. And through this act of sharing, may all desires and attachments quickly cease and all harmful states of mind until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold, nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge. Unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is my noble guide. The Sangha is my supreme support through the supreme power of all these. May darkness and delusion be dispelled. Okay, Jean, Steve, take it away. Um, Steve, do you want to talk a little bit about the recordings and recordings being available and how people might get them? Yeah, so it'll take a little while for me to uh, clean them up a little bit, cut out the the extra pieces, but um, then we'll um, we'll the Bellingham Insight Meditation Society has a YouTube channel, and we'll put it there, mm -hmm. and um, and then perhaps uh, Clear Mountain can take take a copy for there. You probably have a, a YouTube channel as well, so that should happen soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for recording, which is its own kind of purpose and meditation object. So thank you. Um, yeah, um, the only other thing I would say is um, one of the things we do at Bellingham Insight, we uh, meet on Tuesdays and following any retreat that we um, are part of, we also take the time to reflect um, people's experiences um, during the retreat. So we find it's a time that somebody says, oh man, when the Ajahn or Tan said this, it was so amazing. And someone else says, what? I didn't hear that, you know, and someone else says, you know, so it's sort of a way of going on retreat again. So, um, uh, and so we'll, um, if people wanted to come, I mean, we'll make the Zoom link, uh, we're gonna meet only on Zoom. Um, we'll make the Zoom link available and you could join us. It'd be really fun, but um, otherwise. Um, I think other than that, I don't have anything else from us um, except to formally thank you for the teachings and to uh, echo how grateful we are um, that we could be here with you. So thank you. Uh, do we have a link to uh, support the, the monastery development at Clear Mountain? Well, I was actually wondering because I think in the invitation, there was a, a Donna link for both BIMS and Clear Mountain, but we'll definitely put, we should put that out. We would want to make that available to people. So mm -hmm. yes, with, I'm assuming your permission, um, Venerables. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If, if people want to, are inspired to support the project, they're welcome to, but please know that teachings really are offered freely. Um, mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is practice. And yeah, and, and we have some, you know, tune in this month. We have the Ayas coming up, Ayas and Tusik and Ayat Chitananda, um, Stamti Cloud Monastics. And so just be great to see some faces there, certainly. And thank you, Jean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, everybody. It was a really nice day. It's nice to see so many people, so many yeah. people that we actually overflow the big rectangle and have to go to another rectangle <laughs> on the screen that's boundless <laughs> truly yes <laughs> abundant and exalted <laughs> so. okay well have a good have a good week a good rest of your month uh this coming wednesday is uh one of the three main buddhist holidays it's asalaha puja which is in commemoration of 
when the Buddha taught the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta, the turning of the wheel of Dhamma, that was when he first taught the Four Noble Truths. So a great day um, in the history of the world, in case you want to do something special, like meditate a bunch or do something nice for somebody or yourself. So.